Welcome back. I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global. We're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention and we're sitting inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub booth. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of kids that are just finishing uh, T checking out our uh, exhibit, we had probably 30 or 40 kids that just came through with their school. And I, I really wish that that's, uh, that's something I'd gotten a chance to do when I was, uh, looks like they're probably in junior high or may maybe grade 10. Uh, yeah, it's just really cool that there's these kinds of field trips checking out the future energy systems. And speaking of future energy systems, uh, our, next, uh, our next segment here is with Dr. Amit Kumar, who is the Deputy Director of Future Energy Systems at the University of Alberta. Amit, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you know, there is so much happening at the University of Alberta. Um, you know, an unbelievable amount actually happening there. Can you talk, maybe before we get into hydrogen, can you just give me a little bit of a sense of, of the U of A? So if you look about, I think about U of A, U of A is one of the top energy research institute in the world. Um, we have 41,000 students that we train. We have 500 different graduate programs, 200 different undergraduate programs. And there has been a lot of focus on energy research and clean energy research. And, uh, you know, uh, we have been working on all the different types of energy that you can think about. So renewable energy starting from solar, wind, geothermal, biomass energy systems. We look at conventional. I mean, the whole oil sands industry that you see here was built because of the research from University of Alberta. Yeah. And the University of Alberta has contributed significantly over the decades in building that large industry today. You know, it, it's, um, you just mentioned that U of A is, is one of the top uh, research institutions in the world. And actually, I think only two or three days ago, the new rankings came out. And uh, they're in the top, I think, 77 roughly is where they are. But that's, you know, overall, when you look at things like artificial intelligence, they're number two in the world. I think nursing, they're number one. Uh, you know, pharmaceuticals are in the, I think, the top 25 or so. It's, you go on and on and on. And there are areas that, uh, that this province in the University of Alberta, which is located here, you know, right in the heart of Edmonton, uh, there's just so many fields that were, were in the, you know, the top of the world. And so in the area that you're in, uh, how does your, you know, your research and things kind of, I know you're doing some amazing things. Can you give us a sense of kind of where that's at? Um, yeah, so um, my research area is predominantly working on clean energy and yeah. energy systems assessment. Yeah. When I joined way back in 2005, at that time, energy systems as a concept was still pretty uh, you know, nascent. I mean, it, it was not mature. People were not talking a lot about energy systems. It was mostly energy that we use. Yeah. Well, I know what energy is. I'm not so sure I know what an energy system is. <laughs> exactly. And so then the slowly concept, when we started doing this, we looked at the, the whole energy pathways as a system in terms of all the way from production, extraction, production, conversion, transportation and utilization of energy. And that's what we bring in. We look at different pathways of producing clean energy, renewable energy. And we try to assess the environmental and, uh, and the economic impact of these different pathways. And this helps the type of information that we develop, helps the government in developing policies mm. and investment decisions. And that's what we have been doing now over decades. Wow. And, and, and that uh, kind of concept now, it is, it is a pleasure to see now that there is a lot of uh, interest in this area and a lot of work in this area and realizing the importance of this area. Yeah, you know, and this, this whole show that we're here with is really about, you know, connecting the, the research with innovation and now moving into, you know, the real world application. Can you give some examples of, you know, either projects you've worked on or collaborations that just help make that last answer? Like, can you connect it to, here's an example? And, and, and the most recent example, uh, uh, I would give, for example, the hydrogen roadmap that the Alberta mm. government developed. We have been working on hydrogen for about a over a decade, and, and it was predominantly focused on how do we reduce the carbon intensity of hydrogen that we produce. A decade ago, we looked at underground coal gasification, and unmineable right. coal. How do you take that out, produce hydrogen from the syn gas, and then ca capture carbon out of that? And that has translated uh, into a lot of work in looking at different types of production systems, assessing their environmental footprint, what we bring in is a lot of work that we do is in terms of developing fundamental engineering science-based model, 
And these models are pretty complex models. I mean, we talked about hydrogen production, but it doesn't stop there. If you have to look at the overall impact of hydrogen production, so conversion process is in the in middle of the chain. You start all the way from extraction. Yeah. And the moment you start producing more hydrogen, you need more resources. More resources, that means more input energy, which is required. So it's a pretty complex system. And so uh, we have been working in that domain. And uh, that led to uh, a lot of information that we, Alberta specific information that we have developed. And uh, then we did a lot of modeling under the uh, uh, hydro Alberta Hydrogen Roadmap. And for Alberta Hydrogen Roadmap, uh, we ran more than 300 different scenarios uh, to oh, understand wow what is the impact of implementing a particular source of uh, producing hydrogen all the way from producing, transporting, conversion, and then taking it to the demand sector where you utilize it in a different sectors. So we looked at detailed residential commercial sector, um, oil sand sector, industrial sector, uh, and transportation sector. So um, the Alberta Hydrogen Roadmap uh, was a kind of I would say how you utilize the knowledge that we created over a decade and for policy uh, formulation. And, and that's a key example. There are other examples where we have, we have been developing, and the researchers at the university are developing technologies for producing hydrogen through solar, water, sort of solar yeah. splitting, uh, pyrolysis of natural gas. And you see that those technologies are still at nascent stage, but those once become uh, commercial and move up the scale will have a big contribution for Alberta. Yeah, it's really fascinating. You know, we um, the hydrogen roadmap is, is fairly new. It hasn't been around all that long. But just having a really clear federal program of what's going to happen, having a really clear uh, provincial you know roadmap for what's going to happen. You know, with, even within the hydrogen hub, we've got a, a base case that we're now expanding out. You know, it really helps. I, I think, at least, it really helps industries know that there's predictability, there's transparency, and that. There's a commitment from all the levels of government to actually drive this major change and, and transition from you know, other fuels of sources of energy into you know, hydrogen and, and, and many others that are more yes. clean and renewable. Yes, and I think like you know, for Alberta, I mean, if you think about the advantage, from my perspective, um, if you're trying to produce energy and a renewable source, a new energy source, let's say, yeah. you need the resources to produce it, you need the expertise to produce it, you need the workforce, and the infrastructure to produce it. We have been producing hydrogen for decades for our oil and gas industry. Large amount of hydrogen, and at a scale. And uh, what we are now, we have the capability in terms of producing large scale hydrogen. If you look at low carbon intensity hydrogen, um, we are one of the, I would say, leading jurisdiction in carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. And if you marry those two, you will see that we produce low carbon intensity hydrogen. And we have a trained workforce and large resources. Infrastructure in terms of capturing carbon, transporting carbon, we have those uh, pipelines laid uh, already. So if you think about the different ingredients to make a jurisdiction kind of, I would call it a superpower in hydrogen, uh, that is already there, and Alberta has the opportunity to do that. Well, you know, and it's, well, we've had a lot of conversations over the last couple of days. Um, you know, just spoke with, uh, with their products. You know, we've had conversations with David Lazelle with the Trans Transition Accelerator, uh, Mark Plamondon with Alberta's Industrial Heartland. And I, I think you're right. It, it's this mix of uh, huge stores of, of things like natural gas. I think we have the world's third largest reserve. Um, mixed with this carbon sequestration ability that is probably in the top two in the world. Those two together is a big part of that secret sauce, but it's, it's the people, it's the infrastructure, and it's what we've kind of done with it. And it's not that we're starting from scratch. We've been doing this work, as you said, for, for decades, probably decades. at least 40 years. Yeah. So if, if there's a company, and again, we have a number of people watching from, from around the world, if there's a company who's interested in getting involved, it, 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 are you actually doing work right with industry, or is it more of the, the roadmaps and, and kind of government work? Uh, we, we do a lot of work with the industry. In fact, um, some of the work that I started in the hydrogen was through support from industry. Oh, wow. I mean, I lead a chair program, uh, uh, Energy and Environmental Systems Engineering, and this is funded by the, pro by the federal government, but it's a consortium of different 
stakeholders. So you have federal government part of it, large industry part of it, Synovus and Suncor. We have Environment Canada, Natural Resources Canada part of it. So it's a whole consortium uh, of different stakeholders who are part of it. And the type of question that we ask is, again, these transformative questions is, what kind of energy pathways are more uh, economically viable, environmentally friendly, socially acceptable? The bigger question that we try to answer. So we, and, and in fact, at the researchers at University of Alberta, a lot of these uh, programs are industry funded programs. University of Alberta is one of the, the universities where we have the largest number of NSERC industrial research chair in the country, and which are predominantly driven by support from the industry. Mm -hmm. So a lot of work uh, based on industry. Oh, that sounds great. And it's, it's good to know then. You know, one of the things we've been talking about, you know, with the work through Edmonton Globals, we really want to build this into a global epicenter for the hydrogen economy here within the Edmonton region. And it's, it's then about production, which again, we've got in spades. Demand, which you're working on, many others are working on. Uh, and it's, I really like that you're also talking about the innovation play, because there's so much potential here in that innovation space. Uh, so I, I just wonder, like, can you, can you talk about maybe what's coming next in terms of research or, or application or the ability for companies to come in and, um, and you know, do R&D work in this space? And, and so a lot of work that uh, currently you see in, in a lot of new technologies which people are working on, um, one of the challenges that you see even for uh, now for natural gas, so SMR is commercial. Um, but you can capture 52%, you can go all the way to 85% carbon. But then, what is what next? If you look at newer technologies which are coming in autothermal reforming, where you can go up to 90%, 95% mm -hmm. carbon capture. And then you have technologies like natural gas paralysis. So we have people who are working in these forefront, where you try to capture maximum amount of carbon. Uh, we have folks who are working on renewable-based hydrogen, so a lot of, you know, the, the transition, the energy transition will happen, happen yeah. from renewable, low carbon uh, hydrogen, uh, low carbon hydrogen to renewable hydrogen. And, and that will happen with bringing the cost down for the renewable or green hydrogen, we say. Yeah. Um, so there is a lot of work in terms of trying to look at different types of hydrogen production from renewable sources. I personally work a lot on the biomass-based hydrogen system, mm. where we try to look at using these Wood, for, uh, wood residues, or we look at agricultural residues, try to produce hydrogen through that, through thermochemical reform yeah. uh, technologies. So a lot of technologies are being developed which are focused on transitioning um, these fossil-based industry to the renewable-based industry. And I think the key for renewable hydrogen today is high cost. Yeah. So one of the challenges is to bring that down. And, and there is a lot of focus in moving the technology from the lab to the demonstration and commercial scale. So the researchers are working at different points uh, in, in this innovation space. Fantastic. You know, I heard on the, uh, the local news today, uh, one of the researchers at the U of A has a, has a new process that at the end of um, basically a, a fracking uh, uh, methane, that black carbon is created, which is, is a pretty high, highly valuable piece. Are you connected at all with the research happening? Yeah, there? so um, in fact, when we looked at the different technologies, so if you think about natural gas, event, yeah. you can take natural gas to hydrogen through different pathways. The most commercial one that we use, the most mature one, steam methane reforming. Right. The newer one, which is closer to commercialization, we think autothermal reforming. But you have natural gas uh, paralysis or depolymerization that we talk about where you produce solid carbon that solid carbon has value. So you're not producing gas, that solid carbon could be used for, for example, batteries in the batteries. It could be used for remediation. So a lot of different use for solid yeah. carbon. And so uh, there are, like, you know, we, we put a lot of effort in assessing these technologies, developing the fundamental engineering-based models to assess these technologies, understand uh, the environmental footprint, economic footprint, and that's where we are contributing to yeah. these Fascinating. And, and again, just stellar work uh, from you and, and all of your colleagues. It's re it really is world-leading research. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. So you've been part of the, the technical delegation 
um, and technical conference that's happening here. And you know, pretty much everything here is sold out. So the, the strategic conference sold out. The technical conference, it's pretty small. We only have 250 tickets to it. Next right. year, we're going to have to have way more because it's there's people lined up out the door to try to get in. Can you give us a sense of what's happening in those conferences and kind of what your experience so far on, the, on that technical stream has been? Uh, yeah, and I, I think these technical uh, sessions have been very engaging. I was chairing one of the sessions yesterday on production side, and there were speakers who were talking about production, producing hydrogen from different sources. But the audience was very engaging. It's, it's as if like you're having a discussion back and forth. Um, there is a lot of presentations which are on different aspects of hydrogen production, transportation, utilization, carbon capture, and storage. And my sense is the way we are going, and, and as Alberta uh, is further uh, works more towards developing a larger scale hydrogen economy, uh, you will see there is more and more people coming next year and the yeah. following year with a lot of interest in the way we are uh, approaching hydrogen. And, 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 and working towards becoming a leader. The recent announcement, Center of Excellence on mm -hmm. Hydrogen, another key piece. I, th I think that this is a kind of an umbrella under which the different stakeholders could come in. You can private industry, government, academia, public, and, and, and then help in developing this economy further. Yeah, it's, fast. it's wonderful, thanks so much. And I, you know, your comment about it's only gonna get bigger. Our, our goal is to build this into the world's large, largest hydrogen conference. It's already the largest in North America, and uh, we've got at least a 10-year runway. And you know, today we've got around you know three to four thousand people here. Uh, we're hoping within five years we've got 50, 40 to 50 thousand people attending, and that just keeps on growing. So again, and then thanks so much for the conversation. Thanks for all the work that you're doing at the U of A. And uh, I think next I'm going to do a little walk over to Invest in Canada. So, so again, thanks so much. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a okay. Pleasure. So we're going to do a quick little walk. I'm going to switch. There we go. Now I'm switching mics. So we're going to do a little walk over to Invest in Canada. Uh, again, the exhibit floor we have here is, is pretty large. And so we're, we were one of the first, again, because we helped plan this, we were one of the first organizations to book a space. So we've, we've got some pretty prime real estate. And around us, you know, yesterday you met with Explore Edmonton, who's right beside us. The Nikola truck, you know, the hydrogen truck that came up from California is also beside us. We've got the province of Alberta on one side. And then on the other here, we've got our friends that invest in Canada. Oh, excuse me. Katie, nice Hi, to see you. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. Oh, let me just drop my mask on. Oh, so yes. So this is Katie Curran, who's the acting CEO for Invest in Canada. Hi. So good to see you. Excited to be here. Nice to see you too. Yes. So Invest in Canada, you've yes. got a huge footprint. Yes, um, a lot of real estate right here. A lot of real estate, yeah. and really you're kind of in the center of all the action. Absolutely, like uh, we like to be. Yeah, exactly, you're right beside us, you're right by the province, but you really are very much in the middle of all of this flow. How, how busy has the show been for you so far? Oh, it's been fantastic. You can feel the excitement. We've had a steady stream of all sorts of companies and partners come by. It's been really fantastic for us. It's nice to be back out. It is. In person, in these live events again. Yeah, totally. Would, would you be able to give us a quick tour? Absolutely. Okay, Let's go fantastic. in. So we're going to let uh, let the camera slide ahead for of us. For sure. Um, so what, yeah. what day did, uh, did the team come in to start setting up? They came in earlier this week. They came in around Monday, but this booth, we're really proud of it, and we're going to replicate this going forward. But it really gives that space for some close, you know, client yeah. interactions here. We've got another private space around the corner as well, and then of course our, our main booth where people can come watch our fantastic yeah, videos. Love the videos. We love the videos. Yeah, I think that's been a really great feature for us is being able to play some of our marketing yeah, material totally. there. Well, from a marketing perspective. You guys are 100% on yes. brand. Uh, yes. You know, love just how much the red pops off yes. this black. Yes. You know, the great wood floors. It is really a beautiful booth. Absolutely. We need to bring in elements, of course. We have the natural resources. That is just Canada's brand. But when you compare it to then the hydrogen and the new exciting things that we have going on in Canada, I think that pairs really nicely together. Absolutely. You know, you know we're both in the business of basically yeah. selling the country. And, Absolutely. You know, from Edmonton Global, Nobody knows who Edmonton is, right. Right? right? When you look out in the world. So we always start with Canada. Yes. So the work that your team is doing 
yeah. to build this international brand around yeah. investing in Canada yeah. is helping every single community Excellent. across the whole country. Excellent. We really like to hear that. I think Canada's brand has a, is very powerful in the world, but we need to make it even more powerful in the business community. They need to yeah. think of Canada as the top investment destination. And I think we've, we've made some inroads there. We've got still some more work to do, but very happy that our partners and we can work collaboratively with everybody to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you've been very active in other parts of the world. Yes. Uh, I was in Dubai recently. Yes. The Canada Pavilion at Expo was yes. beautiful. Yes, yes. Uh, there's lots of work happening around the world. Yeah. Can you give us just a bit of a, uh, a, a taste of some of the things you've been part of? For sure. So we're really excited. We, we've done Expo Dubai, which was yeah. a huge, massive success for us. We also are looking forward to two big things that are happening in Toronto at the end of June. We have PDAC and we have Collision, which yeah. is really exciting. We're there at Collision. Excellent. Yeah, I think those are really big events for us. It's within Canada, but it draws such a big international yeah. audience. Big investors are coming. Foreign companies are coming, so I think that'll be really good. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know for us, we've and we've talked a little bit about the goals of this conference. Yes. And we're so thrilled that you're here for year one. Yes. We've got a 10-year runway on this, a 10-year yes. deal with DMG. Already, this is the largest hydrogen conference in North America. We want this, and yeah. it's going to be the largest hydrogen conference in the world. Yeah. We think within five years, probably 40 to 50,000 yeah. people is what we're aiming at. Um, can you just speak a little bit about Invest in Canada's commitment to hydrogen, and not just here, there's hydrogen plays across the country. Absolutely, hydrogen of course is a Government of Canada priority, and we see it as a massive investment opportunity for Canada. It helps all sorts of goals in terms of carbon reduction and getting to net zero, and it, but it's really a new industry for Canada that I think has fantastic growth. Yeah. Uh, so we want to be, as Invest in Canada, we want to be at the foreground, so we want to be at these events, and we want to make a name for ourselves about yeah. hydrogen. Love it, uh, it and we're 100% there with you. Excellent. Uh, okay, I think, I think that's probably it. We've Excellent. got some more shows back at our stage. Sounds but just good. again, want to say thanks so much oh, for being you. here. thank um, you. Love what you guys are doing. Excellent. And uh, let's go Canada. Excellent, thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, so we're going to head back. We've, uh, we've got our technology on our, on our first commercial customer, uh, KAG Canada, um, or West Can Transport, better known in Alberta. It's been rebranded recently. And we've got our, um, our dual fuel natural gas diesel blend technology on six of their trucks and have been in their commercial operations for the last few months. And we're here to celebrate that, um, uh, you know, in terms of a greener future. And there's two key points here is one, today we can have an impactful reduction on GHG emissions from heavy duty trucking industry today. And West Can is doing that today. Uh, the other key factor is, is that uh, this is not cost prohibitive and so fleets can actually see fuel savings and for that reason the payout for uh, this investment technology is uh, is very competitive. Yeah, Alberta Innovates has been a great partner. Um, basically, we started the company in March of 2017 and by late 17 we already uh, got a grant with Alberta Innovates on, on a project we were doing at the time which basically spawned to where we are today. For us to hit the point here where we're launching commercialization and it's looking really good, I think that's the point of Alberta Innovates. You know, they're investing money in companies like our, ours at the initial stages, uh, mid stages. We grew from seven to 14 employees during COVID, and we've got plans right now in, in an equity finance we're doing in the US. We're likely going to grow to 40, 45 people in the next 12 to 18 months. And without Alberta Innovates, we wouldn't have been able to do this.
And welcome back. I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global. We're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub exhibit. And it's, uh, there's a little bit of a lull in the crowd at the moment, so we may actually be able to hear each other talk. Uh, so I've got Leland Oberst, who's the CEO and founder of Innovative Fuel Systems. Uh, Leland, welcome. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you here. Um, 
you know, you and I know each other. We've done a, we've done a, a few things promoting the, I think, the really incredible work that Innovative Fuel Systems is doing. For those who are joining us in person and online, can you just give us a bit of a run through on, on what your company does? Sure, thanks, Chris. And, and Chris is being quite understated. They did, Edmonton Global did an article on our company a year ago, and it helped us immensely um, secure contracts and investors. So thanks for that. Oh, you're welcome. So what our company does um, in the heavy-duty trucking space, Class A trucking space, we can get rid of around 45, 50% of the diesel burn and run it on natural gas, CNG, compressed natural gas, renewable natural gas, or liquefied natural gas. And we're commercially ready right now. We've signed three contracts, and we've got trucks on the road right now. Wow. So the big benefits to companies uh, or our customers is obviously there's an emissions reduction, so it's a cleaner burning fuel. Um, natural gas is a lot cheaper than diesel. Yeah. So that's a huge play there Especially they're excited right about. And I think the real important things to our customers is there's no loss of power at all. There's a reason companies choose to have diesel manufactured trucks and the power is critical. So no loss of power at all. Um, so that's what we do today and uh, off to the races, which is exciting. And our next play is to add hydrogen to the mix with diesel. Wonderful. And I think we'll, we'll talk about hydrogen in a second, but um, you jumped over the number kind of quick. So what's the, like right now, what's the emission reduction you're achieving? So from cradle to grave uh, yeah. or full well cycle, um, on certain emissions, we can get up to 40%, wow. but the CO2 reduction, which everybody likes to hear about, yeah. is about 10%, 9, 10% reduction. Okay. That's with the natural gas diesel blend. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, that kind of investment would be made over the life cycle of a truck. So are you, are you doing this with brand new vehicles? Are you retrofitting? Just give us a bit of sense of what your technology does. Sure, that's a great question, actually, because the lifespan of most trucks are 50 to 20 years. But our focus from the beginning has been to work with uh, companies like KAG Canada, formerly yeah. Westcan, where they're turning over their trucks every five years. So we're working on newer trucks, um, and why that's important to the customers is their payback is much better. Yeah. So they've got a longer, you know, a longer period of payback, newer trucks. Um, and the other important thing in how we've designed our system with the newer trucks is it's completely, even though it's a retrofit, it's completely non-intrusive. And this is critical for them because you can't impact the OEM's warranty. Right. Oh, wow. So this doesn't impact the warranty at all? No, it doesn't impact the warranty at all. And in fact, we've had most of the Alberta truck dealerships come to our shop to look at the technology to see how non-intrusive it is so that when uh, the KGs of the world go in for servicing, they'll know how our system works. And if there's a problem, they know it's not us, that it's the diesel side. But if it is ours, it's fully warrantied as well. Okay. But I think the critical thing is it's non-intrusive, and that's what's got the larger companies excited about our product. Okay, so can you, again, I, I'm not the engineer, so don't, don't, let's not get into too technical, but can you kind of help me understand, like, is this fuel input? Is it inside the engine? Like, at what stage are you introducing natural gas and eventually hydrogen? So the natural gas is actually, and again, I'm, I'm not our chief technology okay. officer, but what I can say, it actually, uh, combusts at the same time. Okay. So it's exactly the same time. So we've got injectors, um, obviously the tank where it comes from. We have to yeah. replace one of the diesel tanks and put in either a CNG or LNG tank. Mm -hmm. okay. But everything comes through the injectors and uh, into the cylinder at the same time. Wow. And I know there's, there's been a lot of investment across the province and really across <laughs> North America on you know, natural gas fueling is, you know, and, and diesel you can get anywhere for, for heavy haul. Is it pretty easy for, for big trucking companies to access natural gas right now? Well, not as easy as diesel, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we do have aqua stations in Alberta. Uh, Clean Energy is actually building a station in Short Park that's coming on board in June and one in Calgary at the end of the year. And, and there's certain infrastructure sporadic around Alberta, some private infrastructure. Yeah. So it's not as good as diesel, but it's pretty decent. But the companies we're talking to, as we scale up, they're going to likely be building their own uh, oh, solution in their backyard, so they're right near their diesel stations. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, can you just talk maybe a bit about what's next? Because I know you've got, you've, obviously you've got natural gas right now that's up and running, blended to, uh, with, with diesel. I know you're working on hydrogen, but it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. You need enough production of, of liquefied hydrogen to be able to use it, and your techs really close, right? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, it's funny because we've spent, you know, four and a half years developing 
um, the CNG diesel blend now, and now hydrogen is, you know, as we've seen in this conference, is yeah. starting to take off. But like you said, chicken and the egg, demand supply, we're on the demand side. What I will say is the patents that we filed are not natural gas diesel agnostic. They're, they're actually multi-fuel. Mm. So it could be hydrogen, DME, whatever the fuel base. So we, we did that deliberately two years ago because we thought we knew where the world was going. So our methodologies, our algorithms, our codes, and our patents, basically the vision we have, we know that that'll basically be the same as for a hydrogen diesel mix. We just haven't concentrated the R&D in that to date because there's been no infrastructure. Right. But now with the infrastructure that looks to be built, and we're talking to a couple of groups, uh, looks like things are going to be coming on board in the next couple of years. We're actually going to be starting our development uh, right away on the on the not, sorry on the hydrogen diesel blend. Okay, fantastic. And we had a, a conversation earlier today with Air Products. Of course, they've got a you know a gigantic a 1.3 billion dollar facility that they're building. We're hoping to get the groundbreaking to happen here pretty quick. One of the pieces with that is liquefied hydrogen, which is one of the fuels. You, you know, really, what you need is the liquefied. Uh, Suncor and AMTA made an announcement right before lunch about a hydrogen fueling station that's going to be built uh, in Edmonton that they're working on right now. So there's there's going to be a whole bunch of projects coming forward on fueling stations. So is is that what you need? Like, how how diverse do you need that infrastructure to be before? you know, the trucking companies can really take off? Well, I would say it, over the next sort of 12 to 18 months, yeah. as we uh, launch our pilots in the hydrogen uh, diesel space, um, you know, we're working through how to, you know, remotely get some, the fuel yeah. to the trucking companies to pilot the trucks. And I think we'll get there. In terms of, you know, once we commercialize and start to scale up, yeah, I mean, there needs to be discussion and partnerships and exactly where strategically we put them. Because you know, a fleet that's got 3,000 trucks, I mean, they're going to want to know yeah. that they're going to want to fuel our whole they fleet. They need more they're than not, one they're station. Not, they're, they're either going to do none or they're going to do yeah. all 2,000, 3,000. Yeah. They're not just yeah. going to do five or 10. So I think what I've heard in the last couple of days is the supply is going to come. Yeah. So the demand side better be there. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, supply is, is right on the edge of exploding. And what a lot of the supply side is saying we need the demand. We're making huge investments, multi-billion dollar investments. Uh, it's now, you know, at Edmonton Global, we're, we're working darn hard to build out that demand. We're talking to companies like Mitsui, you know, Toyota, Mitsubishi, you know, many, many others. Uh, we've got, you know, trucks being built, buses being built, a whole bunch of things are all on hydrogen. So it's it's coming close, so, ha so hang in there. Um, and I know you've got, you've got investors, you know, in Canada, you've got investors in the US, I think Texas in particular, can you just give us a bit of a sense of, of where you're at in terms of raises? And again, we, we've, got, we've got a lot of money in the room, a lot of investors who come from around the world looking for companies to scoop up. Are you looking for investments still? Sure. Um, we, we've not closed a, a, a placement in Texas yet. Just, you know, we're, oh, okay. we're talking to some groups though. Um, yeah, so we've, we've done a good job of raising money, pretty much Alberta money to get us where we are today. Yeah. And, uh, we're in the process as we put together our hydrogen consortium. We're putting a hydrogen consortium together right now mm. with uh, a couple of fleets to actually help fund our development yeah. with the government as well. So there's a lot at play that if this conference was even three weeks later, I could share with you. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was going to ask, what can you share about that? So Yeah, so I'll get to that in a bit. But okay. I think once we round that out, you know, when we combine what we've got now that's commercially out there, uh, with what we're going to build over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we're going to be looking uh, to raise some money yeah. to fund that and commercialize both sets of the business. And in terms of the consortium, uh, it's a, it's a it's three companies. We've locked in two, and there's a third we need to lock oh, in. Wow. We've got the, um, the haulers of the hydrogen, poten potential hydrogen, and ultimately the suppliers have locked that in. We've locked those companies up as wow. well that I can't release the names yet but that'll be announced soon, which is really exciting. Okay, well, when you're ready to announce, let us know. We'd love to know and help amplify that. Absolutely, and as part of that too, we've been talking to different levels of the federal, provincial, municipal governments, and they all support it as well. And actually, you know, with the launch of the um, uh, Hydrogen Center of Excellence, yep. is that what it's called? Yeah. Yesterday, which was fantastic news. I knew that was coming. <laughs> 
think a few of us did. And I think that'll be definitely beneficial for us. And they've been proactive reaching out to us, like Alberta Innovates already, uh, where they can help. And they've been great to us in the past. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, Laura and the team at Alberta Innovates are, are amazing. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, there's so many things I want to ask you. Uh, maybe the first one, you know, to, just to bridge to a slightly different topic. You're, you're a really cool company. You've got a lot on the go. I know there's a ton of interest. Why are you here? I mean, we think the Edmonton region is the place to be. But, you know, what's, what's kept you here? Why are you building the company here? Well, first and foremost, I live here, born and raised, and a, and a proud Edmontonian. Um, you know, I, p- people have asked me that, like, why haven't you moved it to sort of, I would say, more uh, greener jurisdictions, if you will, like yeah. British Columbia or even Europe. And I, always, I, and I always tell people the entrepreneurial spirit uh, uh, that my employees have are phenomenal. I don't think you can find it anywhere else. And quite frankly, even the cost, like our rent cost, um, cost of labor is, is, yeah. is, is quite decent in Alberta. Uh, and the entrepreneurial spirit, you can't beat it. And, you know, with some of the skilled engineers that I've, you know, we've been able to hire that's been in the patch, they bring a ton of value, a ton of skills that are transferable into this uh, change into alternative fuels. Um, and like I said, the cost is great, and uh, we're not leaving Edmonton. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. It, it, and one of the things we've been talking about a lot is just the talent that exists here. And you mentioned it briefly there as so you talked about the engineers. And Alberta has more engineers per capita than any other province in the country. Uh, Edmonton, and, you know, just so many engineers. And not just engineers, but we've also got, uh, I think, the second largest fabrication uh, kind of fabricators of steel in North America. I think there's uh, around uh, uh, Houston, there's the only spot with more. So that, that mix of tons of engineers, lots of fabrication, you know, we're, we're a place that moves stuff because you know, all kinds of things move through our region. So that supply chain logistics mixed with the talent and that kind of know-how to build stuff probably makes a, a pretty great place to do what you're doing. No, absolutely. I, there's nothing more I can really add yeah. there. The one thing I would say, too, is that uh, two of our engineers moved from actually Ontario, Southwest oh. Ontario. And actually, their first days they started with us, I think I might have mentioned this to you before, Chris, was the day um, Prime Minister Trudeau shut the country down with COVID. So they oh, right. started oh, right. two years ago in March. So that was quite crazy. But, you know, I always say about Edmonton, people generally have trepidation, you know, moving from Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal to Alberta, particularly Edmonton. But once they get here and they bring their families, they don't want to leave. Yeah. So it's a great community. They're here to stay and uh, we've got a really good team. Yeah, I, yeah, I love it. You know what, we're, I mean, we're veering off topic here a little bit, but uh, you know, some of the studies that have come out, Edmonton is the most affordable major city in Canada. Uh, we've got above average wages. Um, Commute times are next to nothing. You know, it's 20 minutes to get just about anywhere. Even though we're a region of 1.5 million people, it's pretty easy to get around. So that, again, cheap to live here, good pay, and the time, that's where, how you build a life. You know, some of the other places, and again, Canada's a wonderful country. There's lots of incredible cities. But it, it can be a little bit hard to actually, you know, take your kids to soccer and do all the activities, and you can do it here. No, you're right, actually. And, and like I said, the, the folks that have moved from Ontario, they've said the same thing, even though we are a technology company. And I guess in theory, they say you can work from home. You know, we're working with trucks and in- yeah. engines, coding, uh, the ECUs that go in the truck. So being in our office is critical and they want to be there. And they're 15, 20 minute drives almost from where all of them live. And they live all, yeah. over, you know, we're in Northwest Edmonton, our shop. But, you know, some of them live in the South, some live in the West. And, uh, you're right, it's, it's, they can't believe it. They're not, they don't have hour commutes and people are coming in every day. Wow, fantastic. So when you, when you look ahead, you know, let's say five years for innovative fuel systems, uh, what's the company going to look like? In five, well, in or five... You pick, pick a time where you yeah, say, no, this no, is what I, I'm trying I'll to build. Answer your question was five. Yeah. I, you know, in five years yeah. from now, obviously we're going to have a lot of trucks on the road, a lot of yeah. uh, diesel trucks on the road that are either have a you know, natural gas diesel blend or hopefully a hydrogen diesel blend. And, you know, depending on the cost of hydrogen, where it gets to, uh, could be mostly hydrogen, mostly natural gas. I don't know. I mean, a lot of that really depends on government policy. Yeah. And if it sticks or it changes, um, the cost of hydrogen and how quickly infrastructure gets built out, Chris. But what I will tell you, there'll be, there, in five years, there will be thousands of trucks on the road 
uh, that are re reducing emissions and, and hopefully improving companies' margins as well. Yeah, love it. Again, this is a global challenge. We need global solutions. Uh, your company's already making a difference, and I think you know, the world is your oyster in terms of where you can grow and what you can do next. Um, kind of final thoughts, final question. Uh, you know, this is the day two of our first ever hydrogen convention. Already it's the largest one in, uh, in North America. Uh, any thoughts on the conference? Have you been on the, uh, the strategic conference or the technical? You know, just your perspective would be great to hear. Yeah, sure. I, I've not been to any of the technical courses. Uh, my chief technology officer has been to a lot of them, great. obviously. Um, what I would say is there's a lot of great energy. I'm really impressed. Uh, a lot of great energy. You know, it's funny. When I was in grade 11, our, our class took a field trip to Vancouver um, for uh, Canadian Expo was in Vancouver. Mm. And Ballard had a booth. And they were talking about hydrogen. <laughs> yeah. So and I raised that because hydrogen is not new, as you know. Right. But what I would say, you know, listening to everybody on stage and just talking to people, this time it's real. It's gonna, st it's gonna stick. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to do, uh, but I think we've got the group in Edmonton, Alberta, and Canada to get there. Um, and I think what the last two days, it's been very positive. There's some tough conversations that need to be held mm -hmm. of what's realistic in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. And I think at least I've noticed in the reception last night, those were had, those don't happen on stage. I get it. Um, but it's starting to foster those conversations. So I'm glad we did, I think this is a great job, everybody involved to, to putting it on, very impressed. Yeah, we're, we're super, super happy with how this is going so far. At, at the conference and, and the conversation with you. So thanks so much for coming down. Uh, so we're going to uh, take a quick break uh, and we'll be back in a few minutes with the next conversation here from the Canadian Hydrogen Convention and the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub exhibit. See you soon. Thanks, Chris. Welcome to the Synthetic Edmonton Region, a virtual environment where we model the future of low carbon hydrogen for the next 25 years in the rapidly growing $2.5 trillion global market. The Edmonton region is located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands and gathering place of First Nations and Métis people. This region is fast becoming a North American launch point for the hydrogen economy and a global epicenter, attracting investment because of its ability to produce low-cost, zero-emissions hydrogen at a global scale. The province of Alberta produces more than 60% of Canada's hydrogen, with much of that production occurring in Alberta's industrial heartland. Unique geology and existing infrastructure suitable for carbon capture, utilization, and storage are enabling the production of net zero hydrogen and attracting investment from energy intensive industries looking to meet global net zero commitments. The region is rich in talent, educated, and growing, with more engineers per capita than any other province and a global hub for artificial intelligence. The Edmonton region is home to seven universities, colleges, and polytechnics, and 120,000 students. Proven by our history of building, operating, and maintaining energy infrastructure, our experienced workforce includes more Indigenous workers than any other province in Canada. To optimize hydrogen development in the Edmonton region, and to help meet global demands for energy and emissions reduction, we are deploying advanced modeling and scenario-based intelligence we call synthetics to design success. Let's look ahead at hydrogen demand from the transportation sector, in particular, commercial and municipal fleets. In 2023, we begin to address the performance risk of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles in our first pilots of zero emission trucking along the Edmonton-Calgary corridor, the largest of three heavy transportation corridors in the region accounting for up to 19,000 trucks per day. The first hydrogen fuel station will be located in an area supporting both commercial trucking and municipal fleets, and near new hydrogen production facilities, an efficient co-location strategy. This strategy allows us to assess demand acceleration scenarios with varying adoption rates of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles and more inexpensive retrofits of hydrogen diesel dual fuel trucks. While existing fleets are still in service, dual fuel retrofit trucks reduce GHG emissions and range anxiety while rapidly building hydrogen demand. As demand grows and fleets are replaced, the number of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles continues to grow. 
By 2024, demand from as many as 200 fuel cell vehicles allows a cost advantage for hydrogen over diesel. In a market of over 34,000 heavy-duty vehicles currently registered in the Edmonton region, 30 tons of liquid hydrogen is produced in the region every day, providing fuel for all of Western Canada's transportation demands. In 2028, hydrogen blending activities started in 2022 by ATCO are scaling. For example, 20,000 tons of hydrogen are being blended into the natural gas grid. Looking forward, an increasing number of natural gas boilers, stationary generators, and CHP units at building and industry sites will run on a mixture of natural gas and low carbon hydrogen, contributing to their emissions reduction goals. From 2030 and beyond, heavy transportation shifts, displacing diesel. Several global scale net zero hydrogen projects are complete led by the first phase of Air Products $1.3 billion facility. As new and repurposed pipelines are added to expand the existing network, costs of hydrogen at the pump will drop to as little as one-third of the anticipated cost at other hydrogen refueling stations around the world. As the hydrogen trunk line is built further south, it will supply and power more fuel cell vehicles, more buildings and industries, including Edmonton International Airport, part of Port Alberta, Western Canada's inland port, where air, rail, pipelines and roadways converge in a logistics hub. The Edmonton International Airport extends its reputation as Canada's innovation airport, leading airport and airline decarbonization around the world. In the next decade, select countries import hydrogen to meet their demand. Japan, Germany, South Korea, and areas of the US, such as California, have multi-billion dollar import potential. Countries and companies around the world look to the Edmonton region as a potential source for large-scale net zero hydrogen. Shell and Mitsubishi begin activating the Memorandum of Understanding signed in 2021 for producing hydrogen for export to Japan. Access to rail, pipelines, and transportation corridors currently figure centrally in existing energy export capability. The whole world needs to come together to significantly reduce our carbon footprint and contribute to a net zero future by 2050. The Edmonton region will play a leadership role in mitigating the catastrophic impacts of climate change through transitioning to a net zero carbon economy locally, as well as helping others achieve their climate objectives. From 2022 to 2050, we have radically transformed and grown our economy by attracting investment and providing up to $100 billion in economic value every year for the last two decades. The future is our focus, and the time to invest is now.
Welcome back. I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global. We're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention, sitting inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub exhibit. And if you were joining us just over the last five, six minutes, you saw this amazing video about the future of the Edmonton Region and the build out of our hydrogen economy from today to 2050. Now we did a lot of work on that. There's information from a, from a base case, there's information from a whole bunch of sources that have been baked into that. But to turn all that data into something I think is pretty magical was run with the synthetics. And we've got Myrna Bittner here, who's the founder and co-CEO. Uh, Myrna, first of all, thanks so much for that video. It is awesome. I'm really glad you like it. We liked it too. Uh, really fascinating to meet all of the people who are involved and engaged in uh, accelerating hydrogen in the area. And, uh, and wonderful to do some work uh, in Canada. Uh, it was one of the kickoff projects that, that we are doing in Canada. Most of our work is international. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I could spend the whole time just talking about that video and kind of how we built that and what's happening. But let's start by talking really about, about you and the team at Run With The Synthetics. So you, know, you just mentioned that most of the work you're doing is international. Can you just kind of explain what it is that you guys do? Okay, um, I'll start back, but not really back at the beginning, because it's been a long uh, running start, decades of, of kind of building a technology and a capability. But uh, our company started eight years ago, and we started by recognizing that the world was becoming really complex, and that uh, these systems were kind of outstripping people's ability to uh, contend with the realities that they were going to face until they faced them. And then it was almost too late. So there was a lot of uh, firefighting and a lot of mistakes and inefficiencies. Uh, and so we built the capability to build synthetic realities. And these synthetic realities, we could uh, focus on making them as realistic as possible with human behavior and activity and policy and environment and connected systems. And, uh, and it wasn't very long until we were asked, well, can you do this in a city? And mm -hmm. can you characterize a city or a region? And, uh, and that started in, in 2019. And then in earnest, we have been building cities, which are actually systems of systems and regions, and dialing forward the future of those cities so people can prepare or mitigate or de-risk or even, uh, even pursue really innovative opportunities and understand in the sandbox environment um, with the data that they need to support their decisions today, what the impacts are going to be tomorrow. There is so much there to ask about. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to drill in a little bit, but you know, you, you're going to lose me quick if we get too much into the detail. So when you talk about building virtual environments, again, I, I know just from our experience with the videos and some of the work you've done for us, but for someone who's never seen your work, like they might be thinking, oh, like you know, Second Life or video game kind of things. It is not that at all. It's it's really grounded in, I think, the reality of of the systems that exist. Can you just maybe explain that a bit so that people have the right mental image? Correct. So. Uh, we really look for uh, incorporating as much information as is available, and it's kind of a convergence uh, idea. So we bring, uh, we bring data and expertise and geospatial information and images and an understanding of how a city is built and its critical infrastructure and how that operates. And, and then, then we, uh, where part of our special sauce is, is that we are uh, enabled by our technology to synthesize the population. So an actual SimCity type, living, reactive, responsive, intelligent uh, it, population that is accurate for a region, but never identified. And so that, that is part of what enables us to then dial forward, dial forward new energy behaviors, transportation choices, growth, density, um, how much water people consume today and, and maybe you know, 10 years from now. Uh, and, but it also enables us to play forward the impact of policy. Mm. So policy change and incentives, um, our population can have psychographics that are accurate and based in research and, uh, and, and can be quantified. And we can survey our populations as well. So that's one of the fun things that we do is when we dial forward these scenarios. And we've done some, uh, some pretty uh, challenging scenarios, such as disaster scenarios. We can, we can actually uh, survey our population to find out how they're feeling and what they're thinking, why they're making the choices that they have in ways that uh, current technologies and current survey and, and current surveillance cannot capture. So it enables us to play forward with the future and, uh, and, and really uh, understand in a quantified way 
what the impact of our choices are going to be. Yeah, just fascinating. I, I'm sure there's urban planners who are listening to this or, or have heard you talk whose minds are blown as you talk about what's actually possible. We, we are working with some here yeah. in the Edmonton region as well. So, wow. yes. Yeah. So maybe let's talk then about, you know, where are okay. some of the places you're doing work? So uh, we had a really interesting experience because when we started in cities, uh, we started uh, at the top of the Electric Power Research Institute in, in the U.S., uh, and that was that was our second major city uh, was Phoenix in the U.S. doing a dual disaster. And then during COVID, it really liberated our ability to reach around the world without having to travel um, because we were a small and growing team. So a lot more time on our hands. So we got involved in Kuala Lumpur, for example, with wow. the Toyota Mobility Foundation, really characterizing how they were going to meet their 2040 targets, which involved decarbonization, but also involved really uh, strenuous targets about SDG and economic access and accessibility and inclusivity. Uh, and so we did mobility models of the city of Kuala Lumpur uh, last year as well. Then we've done some work in Europe, uh, so Switzerland and Germany, and, and a lot of work in the United States. And we're starting in LATAM. Okay. Well, I know that there's yeah. been a couple times where I've reached out to you, you know, to ask for you know, advice or connections or, or project updates. Yeah. I think we've been on calls from where you've been on call. You've been in like California, Washington, I think Portugal, uh, Grenoble, France. It seems yes. like every time we talk, you're someplace else. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. Yes. Yeah. Last couple of weeks was Houston and Denver and Washington, D.C. Wow. Which uh, Washington, D.C. was one of our um, the, the, the pinnacle achievements for our team lately. Uh, it was a huge... Uh, environment that we did synthesizing the eastern coast as well as Washington DC for uh, uh, you know two handfuls worth of government agencies in the US as well as uh, the grid operators and what they're trying to uh, figure out how to contend with is uh, some really severe uh, solar weather and so they were using a brand new launched product that we have which is a synthetic tabletop and they were using that to play forward scenarios where they had input all of their expert data and models and they were wanting to understand the future of the grid and whether or not they could mitigate it and with what data and information and what processes they would need um, to save us all. Yeah, so just trying to comprehend that, um, the data sets must be gigantic then if you're looking at all those different pieces. They are, and, uh, and that's again one of the, the things that we have developed with our technology is the ability to uh, ingest those data, data sets, integrate them, connect them, uh, augment them with the synthetic data, so the data that's missing from mm. scenarios that haven't happened yet, or that's missing just in general because it hasn't been collected, or that's missing because it's hidden behind regulatory um, doors and, and process. And so we augment that, and then we have the ability to visualize it um, uh, in, in very efficient ways yeah. uh, and very powerful ways. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah. powerful. So how do you do that then? You must be using AI or machine learning or something to kind of dive into that data. We do. We have uh, a really deep tech stack that we have been working on for a few decades now that's finally kind of reaching its glory. Part of it comes from a neural net and 3D visualization research company that uh, that we had in the 90s. So um, it's it's not you know just fresh out of the box. Uh, but yes, there's a lot a lot of artificial intelligence. We work towards making that all explainable um, because when we invite people into the room to examine some of these really critical issues and the future of a city and and the future of a of a hydrogen for example in in the edmonton region we really want them to have the confidence in how we have created models to generate missing data um, how we have integrated models of others and of experts so we have focused always on making that really explainable but wow. um, but yes there is some really interesting ai back there yeah okay um you know, I think years ago I did a little work in disaster things and they're looking at modeling. It was mostly maps with highlighters showing where danger might be. Yes. Um, this, this is way more advanced than that. This is, yes. And I think one of the interesting things is about, you know, why we're here today for hydrogen and the changing planet um, that, that we exist in is that all of these technologies and these advancements in sustainability also offer the opportunity to partner those advancements with resilience. Mm. And when we look at these disaster scenarios, it's really important that we characterize and understand how these new technologies can add to that and contribute to our resilience as a society. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
so I'm curious. I mean, I, we we talk a lot about the role of talent in investment attraction. Yes. And we've got some real, especially at the University of Alberta, but we've got, you know, eight universities, colleges, polytechnics, somewhere between 120 and 140,000 students, which is you know almost 10 percent of the total population of this region, which is is pretty amazing. Um, but the U of A, their computer science department, is you know the best in the world. Uh, you know, top one, top two. Their artificial intelligence uh, you know, research is you know, consistently number one, number two, like for like you know, 25 years. Um, is that talent pool really what's also helping your company just grow and thrive? Yes, and, and more than just that talent pool, because we hire a really diverse group of, of experts. So we have uh, engineers and civil, environmental, mechanical, electrical, uh, comm sci, yeah. um, a human behavior specialists, 3D animation, and I think this is this is all part of uh, the design of, of companies in the future too. Is having that that diverse talent pool. Um, it, it gives us uh, opportunities. I think in the U of A is also renowned, you know, um, because of you know being in an energy society as well and an energy focused area of the world um, in in producing that engineering talent, which we um, absolutely love and uh, and take advantage of. Which brings me also to Edmonton Hydrogen yeah. and the work we're doing. Yeah, eventually and, we have to talk about yeah, hydrogen. Eventually we do, yes. And the work we're doing in the workforce uh, and, and modeling the workforce and the future of that workforce also heavily relies on that talent pool. Yeah. And, and in, a, in a few ways, it's just spectacular for Edmonton and the future of Edmonton. Um, the, uh, the opportunities it offers, that talent pool for the young workforce uh, yeah. who, you know, in 2040 is going to be uh, predominantly starting their careers in, in hydrogen and then advancing in hydrogen. Um, the number of clean tech jobs and growth in clean tech jobs uh, that, you know, our, our post-secondary institutes are aligning with, their programs with. Uh, in 2040, I think we were estimating there was going to be about 49,000 clean tech jobs versus, you know, uh, traditional uh, energy jobs, which would be about 17,000. So oh, wow. those those rates are going to really uh, outstrip, I think, uh, traditional jobs, and we're really well positioned with the the talent uh, generators that we have in our post secondaries here to to meet that that need and that demand. Yeah, it's amazing, and, and I'm glad you pulled us into hydrogen because. I could ask yeah. probably a thousand questions about what you guys are up to. Um, can you maybe just talk about, again, we've, we've talked about the talent piece that, yeah. that you're undertaking on behalf of the whole region. What's some of the other work you're doing around synthetic modeling in hydrogen? I know talent's one, there's other areas though too. Yeah, so we were looking at workforce, we were looking at economy, um, we are looking at the growth of, of Edmonton and what that means because as you know, hydrogen is kind of being uh, infused into, into our, our, our city, uh, there's also this, this expansion or this growth of the population and what does that mean with how we can uh, look forward and prepare and attract and retain you know, those, those clean tech workers. Some of the other work we're doing around hydrogen modeling is around the transportation sector. So really understanding you know, who and how and when adoption will happen. Um, it's not always a rational economic choice uh, when, when these big disruptive changes are happening. So part of the psychographic work that we do and, and in being able to characterize people and how they perceive risk uh, we can also connect that with the labor force that's available and have we prepared in that way the people to maintain those trucks, the people that have the knowledge to drive those trucks, the, the infrastructure and the people who work at those fueling stations. You know, uh, that, that all works into that adoption risk of the people who are looking at planning their fleets and, uh, and that, that more rational economic choice of have we incented hydrogen to the price where it makes sense for them. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you're a company that, you know, you've, you've had other companies, now you've got Runth Synthetics. Yes. You've already won a ton of awards, though, despite being only, you know, three years, old, three years old. So awards and recognition, can you give just a little sample of what's been happening? Oh, wow. Um, one of our favorite awards uh, was the Most Edmonton Company uh, last year. Uh, which was really uh, designed to highlight a company that had impact and was also, uh, you know, highly focused on diversity and equity and inclusivity. We're a women-led company. Uh, we have a high percentage of women uh, as a part of our team, even though we are a deep tech uh, company. And, uh, and we're also a certified Aboriginal business mm. uh, through my co-founder. 
And, and that's really important for us to, to highlight, you know, the art of the possible. Second, well, unless I'm on an international stage, we won the global call of the United Nations for the Industry Development Organization uh, for decarbonizing growing urban environments, which recognize the work that we've done around the world in cities as they're planning uh, decarbonized mobility and, and transportation, and, uh, and also recognize the work that we have done uh, towards SDGs, uh, so sustainable development goals yeah. um, uh, in those cities. Um, Taiwan's Top Technology Gold Medal Award was a real surprise, but a very uh, welcome surprise. Um, we've been uh, co-winners with the Electric Power Research Institute into the AFWorks uh, Innovation Showcase. Um, and I'm probably missing yeah, I, I'm <laughs> about sure you're 20 missing others. Few. But it, it, 2021 was a great year yeah. for us. Yeah, and I, I, I wanted to ask that question first, because the next question is, companies that are in the startup scale-up stage are always looking for capital. Uh, we've got yes. investors here from all over the world, many of them coming looking for, for you know, joint ventures, for all kinds of partnerships, you know, look for companies to do work on projects. Are you looking for investment funding? You know, where are you at? Yeah, so we've, we've had a, a, an interesting kind of trajectory happen in probably the last six months. Uh, so we've already booked more revenue in, in 2022 than we, well over the amount that we had in 2021, and we've always been a profitable revenue-funded company, uh, which is also an interesting uh, kind of uh, oddity for AI companies. Um, but that has kind of pushed us into making a choice, and so we've got a data room that we're preparing. I presented at uh, the National Renewable Energy Labs Industry Growth Forum last yeah. uh, two weeks ago. I was in Denver. Uh, and we're preparing to open a round. We can be um, careful about the partners that we choose uh, for that round, but there's so much that we're leaving on the floor um, that I think investment would help us grow into and uh, that that's, that's coming. Yeah, well, yes. I, I know from, uh, from our perspective, we've been blown away by the work you're doing. Every time we show it off, we've got more people asking, how do we be part of this? How do we help build out the models around our community? Um, and, I, and I know that that's happened in other communities around the world. So um, you probably won't be able to grow fast enough, would be my bet. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, again, thanks yeah. so much. I know you're up for an award tonight, speaking yes. of awards. Yes. So best of luck with that. Oh, I think thank you. you know, we all have our fingers crossed that you're going to win yet one more. Um, and then the other thing I want to ask you, uh, we're here again at the Canadian yeah. Hydrogen Convention. It's the first time we've ever hosted this. Yes. Uh, you know, already it's the largest hydrogen convention in North America. Uh, we've got a goal to build it into the largest hydrogen convention in the world within five years. You know, we're hoping to have about 50,000 people here in five years. We're going to need a bigger facility, but yes. we're planning on having it here. Um, just wondering, you know, if we brought you back in five years to do the same kind of a talk, do you have a sense of where you're going to be? Um, that's a really fascinating question, and I see a lot of big blank walls around. So we're doing, a, part of what we've developed is a 3D immersive tabletop, that, that, that's what we launched in Washington. And Washington, D.C. got to see itself and see itself experiencing a coronal mass ejection event. Uh, so I would really like to see a, a 3D immersive yeah. uh, Edmonton region. Something more region. positive than disasters. Yes, uh, uh, transitioning into hydrogen yeah, so that totally. people can actually walk through it, step in it, look at it, interact with the data, um, and, and understand the, the power of information and bringing science and techno-economic modeling and, uh, and hydrogen and supply chains and people out of reports <laughs> that sit on people's desks and into a, a, a living, understandable reality. So that's that's where I want this. This this could, this could be big enough. This hall for that. Okay. Wow, one one hall for just <laughs> your exhibit. I'm, sure. Let's let's do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> so Myrna, thanks thanks so much for being part of yeah. this. Uh, again, I've said it probably eight times, but we're just huge fans of the work that you're doing. Yeah. And, we look for good partners to work with, and you're, you guys are at the top of the list. You're really amazing. Well, thank both, you. Both you and the whole team. Thank you to Edmonton Global for giving us this opportunity. It's yeah. been amazing. Well, it's our pleasure. Uh, okay, so we're going to take a quick break, uh, and then we'll be back with more. Next one, we're talking about global collaborations and innovation, and we've got the European Canada Commission on Innovation as well as Innovate Norway. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome to the Synthetic Edmonton Region, 
a virtual environment where we model the future of low-carbon hydrogen for the next 25 years in the rapidly growing $2.5 trillion global market. The Edmonton region is located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands and gathering place of First Nations and Métis people. This region is fast becoming a North American launch point for the hydrogen economy and a global epicenter, attracting investment because of its ability to produce low-cost, zero-emissions hydrogen at a global scale. The province of Alberta produces more than 60% of Canada's hydrogen, with much of that production occurring in Alberta's industrial heartland. Unique geology and existing infrastructure suitable for carbon capture, utilization and storage are enabling the production of net zero hydrogen and attracting investment from energy intensive industries looking to meet global net zero commitments. The region is rich in talent, educated and growing with more engineers per capita than any other province and a global hub for artificial intelligence. The Edmonton region is home to seven universities, colleges and polytechnics and 120,000 students. Proven by our history of building, operating, and maintaining energy infrastructure, our experienced workforce includes more Indigenous workers than any other province in Canada. To optimize hydrogen development in the Edmonton region, and to help meet global demands for energy and emissions reduction, we are deploying advanced modeling and scenario-based intelligence we call synthetics to design success. Let's look ahead at hydrogen demand from the transportation sector. In particular, commercial and municipal fleets. In 2023, we begin to address the performance risk of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles in our first pilots of zero emission trucking along the Edmonton Calgary corridor, the largest of three heavy transportation corridors in the region, accounting for up to 19,000 trucks per day. The first hydrogen fuel station will be located in an area supporting both commercial trucking and municipal fleets and near new hydrogen production facilities, an efficient co-location strategy. This strategy allows us to assess demand acceleration scenarios with varying adoption rates of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles and more inexpensive retrofits of hydrogen diesel dual fuel trucks. While existing fleets are still in service, dual fuel retrofit trucks reduce GHG emissions and range anxiety while rapidly building hydrogen demand. As demand grows and fleets are replaced, the number of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles continues to grow. By 2024, demand from as many as 200 fuel cell vehicles allows a cost advantage for hydrogen over diesel in a market of over 34,000 heavy duty vehicles currently registered in the Edmonton region. 30 tons of liquid hydrogen is produced in the region every day, providing fuel for all of Western Canada's transportation demands. In 2028, hydrogen blending activities started in 2022 by ATCO are scaling. For example, 20,000 tons of hydrogen are being blended into the natural gas grid. Looking forward, an increasing number of natural gas boilers, stationary generators, and CHP units at building and industry sites will run on a mixture of natural gas and low carbon hydrogen, contributing to their emissions reduction goals. From 2030 and beyond, heavy transportation shifts, displacing diesel. Several global scale net zero hydrogen projects are complete, led by the first phase of Air Products' $1.3 billion facility. As new and repurposed pipelines are added to expand the existing network, costs of hydrogen at the pump will drop to as little as one third of the anticipated cost at other hydrogen refueling stations around the world. As the hydrogen trunk line is built further south, it will supply and power more fuel cell vehicles, more buildings and industries, including Edmonton International Airport, part of Port Alberta, Western Canada's inland port, where air, rail, pipelines and roadways converge in a logistics hub. The Edmonton International Airport extends its reputation as Canada's innovation airport, leading airport and airline decarbonization around the world. In the next decade, select countries import hydrogen to meet their demand. Japan, Germany, South Korea, and areas of the US, such as California, have multi-billion dollar import potential. 
Countries and companies around the world look to the Edmonton region as a potential source for large-scale net-zero hydrogen. Shell and Mitsubishi begin activating the Memorandum of Understanding signed in 2021 for producing hydrogen for export to Japan. Access to rail, pipelines, and transportation corridors currently figure centrally in existing energy export capability. The whole world needs to come together to significantly reduce our carbon footprint and contribute to a net zero future by 2050. The Edmonton region will play a leadership role in mitigating the catastrophic impacts of climate change through transitioning to a net zero carbon economy locally, as well as helping others achieve their climate objectives. From 2022 to 2050, we have radically transformed and grown our economy by attracting investment and providing up to $100 billion in economic value every year for the last two decades. The future is our focus, and the time to invest is now.
Welcome back. I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global, and we're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub booth. Now, this, this whole presence, you know, everything we're doing with the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub has really been a massive collaboration of all of the municipalities that are here in our region, the federal government, the provincial government, uh, a number of First Nations and industry. And that theme of, of collaboration really is what our next conversation is about. So it's, it's really great that we've got Britta Barron, who's the president of the European Canadian uh, Centre for Innovation and Research, and Amid Shirazi, who's a senior advisor with Innovate Norway. Because again, it's not just about how do we do collaboration here, if we're going to solve the climate crisis and, and really have hydrogen take off as one of the solutions, we need to work together. So can you maybe, Britta, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what do you do and um, you know, then we'll kind of get into more next. Okay. So my name is Britta Baron and I'm the president of a small organization based here in Edmonton, uh, covering, however, not just Alberta, but also Canada more broadly. Uh, called the European Canadian Centre for Innovation and Research and the idea is that we are offering help, uh, various mechanisms of help to support companies who want to go international and not so much for export but really for product development, mm. for learning about uh, new solutions, for finding partners, for finding new talent, for finding access to to capital, whatever it is that, that promotes your business and that, that your business uh, needs, we are helping companies to find that in Europe. Okay, wonderful. And me, how about uh, Innovate Norway? Well, what we do is we say we give local ideas global opportunities and I guess a part of that is about uh, collaboration and building bridges. So I mainly help um, Norwegian companies and ecosystems and clusters uh, to establish and grow their uh, collaboration or business in Canada. And, and I know you've, you've brought a whole bunch of Norwegian companies here. Can you just give us a sense of the delegation that's come? Yes, the delegation has a deep expertise in hydrogen and carbon capture. We have companies that are uh, different players in the value chain of hydrogen and carbon capture. And I don't know if we get a chance to discuss later, but uh, Norway has invested uh, a lot over the past 10 to 20 years or so in different aspects of uh, sustainability and clean tech and green energy. So we are here to explore collaboration opportunities. That's great. And we're, we're happy to have you here too. Okay. We've got, I think, about 19 delegations uh, from different countries around the world. I think the Norway group is actually one of the larger ones. Yes. And so it's, you know, we. For those who are here in Edmonton, they'll know that we got a little snow this morning. Yes. So at least we know that the Norwegian delegation is, is pretty comfortable with that. They probably no. felt like they're back at home. In Norway, there is a saying that there is never bad weather, it's bad clothing. So as long <laughs> as you got the right jacket, you're good. Yeah, we say that here too. The other thing we say is if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes because I think it's <laughs> nice out now. Uh, so Britta, can you talk, maybe talk a little bit about um, how to kind of make that idea of innovation and you know collaboration real? Like, what, what are some, maybe some examples of what companies or universities or others could be doing? Yeah, to, to, to start off with just making, closer. start off with saying that yes, indeed, we are not only uh, aiming at companies, but academic institutions, non-for-profits, NGOs. We would also help them. We'll work with them. And good good examples are really some. We had a focus group meeting yesterday uh, because we want to understand better, also at larger scale, what is it that motivates companies to go international and what holds them back. Um, and usually, the the story of how they went international starts a with personal experience and personal background, and b with a problem. I have a problem, and it's it's damn difficult. I can't find the solution. And I'm looking elsewhere to, for that solution, for that partner company that brings me that technology that I don't have and that will speed up uh, my access to market and my product development. Or I find that partner who will help my distribution system. You know, I can use his or her distribution system in a given country. Often these partnerships go multi-layered. Mm. They start on a particular access to a particular technology and then they go like oh and then we discovered we could also use that partner for distribution and then oh then we discovered we can actually buy that partner <laughs> which happened you know with someone some of our st stories happen that way yeah. that they actually then end up buying the the partner in Europe or the other way around frankly yeah. you know, you know it, it's it's 
there's so many things that you said that are really interesting. But I'm going to go back. You, you said you know they start with. I think often the beginning of that though is making the decision to look international, and Alberta in particular has been. We've been really fortunate that so much of our industry, you know, is happening here. There's so many things happening. There's so much money that's been here mm -hmm. thanks to oil and gas. But it's meant that we often haven't looked at the rest of the world. And so it makes me, you know, we, we're constantly having conversations with people about saying, yes, your customer can be next door, but your customer could also be in Norway. Your partner could be in France. Your partner could be in Asia. But making that decision sometimes is the hard part. So if you go prior to the how you said start, what, what do you do or how do you encourage people to to actually think about this as being a possibility. Well, that's exactly what we're now trying to find yeah. out. What are the mechanisms that trigger the interest? Uh, we, we heard from somebody yesterday that, that really necessity is the mother of all invention. Yeah. If I really have a you know awkward problem and I don't have the comfort level of you know ample government funding, then I'm going to scratch my head and then I'm trying to to look for that other solution that often enough yeah. is then abroad. So. To, to motivate and to encourage that confidence that yes, I can find the solution abroad and that it will give me the, the competitive edge uh, and it will sh you know really promote my company. We, ha we heard fantastic success stories and we have them in, in our reports. It's not, I mean, in, for, for what I have seen, there's not a single company that has worked with us. Once they work with us, they all love it and they oh, all wow. find uh, you know, really a great usefulness in opening up internationally, it's to get them there, as, yeah. as you have uh, yeah. mentioned. Start, yeah, starting exact, the process. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. So, Hamid, I'm, I'm curious, are there, are there things we should be learning from Norway around, you know, that, that internationalization, uh, you know, collaboration, looking at the world, or, or does Norway have a similar challenge that, that often we have here in Canada? I think there are a lot of similarities between Norway and Canada, particularly Alberta. First of all, we both have a long established history in the oil and gas, so we are global energy players. Uh, the differences is in Alberta, a lot of the oil and natural gas resources are under the ground. In Norway, is under the seabed. So there are opportunities and differences. What happening is, with the focus on internationalization, you see also similarities that a lot of companies in Norway are small and entrepreneurial, so they have to try and experiment. So there are a lot of technical know-how, and again, very similar to a lot of companies that operate in Alberta. There are a lot of advantages, in my opinion, that comes when, um, when companies are small. They can move fast, they can experiment better, and they have lower overhead um, expenses. But with that also comes limited resources. Mm -hmm. Usually when it comes to innovation, the talent, the capital, the infrastructure, the tools, they are not always uh, accessible locally. And in my experience, what could be a challenge for a company might have been a challenge for another company three, five, 10 years ago. So by staying curious and look outside our borders and technological or business domains, we can learn a lot to minimize mistakes and failures. It's unavoidable, we will all have to go through that, but we can make it faster and easier. Okay, I, I love that. It sounds really like the mentality that we've got here. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really great answer. And it's, it's nice to know that Norway's got a lot of the same you know, feeling around you know, the value of, of startup and collaboration um, and funding innovation. So if we shift a little bit into, into hydrogen, again, we're here for this hydrogen show, w what do you see happening inside, whether it's your partner organizations, you know, within your own organization, inside your ecosystems, you know, what, what's coming next from this? Well, we're always looking into Europe and what's happening in the European energy market. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of the people here, either directly or indirectly, are influenced by the uh, sad circumstances that have completely redefined the energy agenda in Europe. Absolutely. And obviously hydrogen is big, big, big. I remember a year ago I started a conversation um, in another part of Canada in Ontario around hydrogen and it was like, hydrogen? Why hydrogen? Nobody is asking that question anymore. It's, it's utterly clear to anybody how much hydrogen is a key part of the answer to the, the newly defined energy crisis and, and energy challenge. Yeah, I completely agree. 
I think one of the factors that we should be mindful of is when it comes to Canada, compared to Norway, of course, it's such a large country. Yeah. And with that vast amount of land that we have, there are many regional differences. So when it comes to hydrogen implications and applications, we have to look at those differences. For example, if you look at some of the eastern provinces, they have a much higher ratio of hydroelectric. Then you come to Ontario, there is a high ratio of hydroelectric and nuclear. Then we don't have much nuclear uh, in other places. So we have to see what agenda we are pursuing. But for example, speaking of Norway, Norway has one of the highest concentration of electrical vehicles uh, on the planet. So they have planned to reduce emissions from transportation. For example, when you look at the seaways and ferry transportation, they have invested a lot in hybrid technologies to eliminate the need for diesel uh, engines. And also they are now moving to hydrogen ferry. So, uh, there is a lot to be learned from other jurisdictions. If you look at in Canada, and Alberta is a major producer of hydrogen. So we have to think about how we could look at other countries that are more mature and more evolved in a hydrogen value chain to look after the transport of hydrogen or carbon storage or carbon utilization. And those regional variations and differences is what uh, dictates uh, the more prime opportunity. So I think it's a mistake that we kind of have a one size fit all for Canada. We have to kind of be very focused on regional differences and see where we can have the greatest impact. Yeah, again, great point. You know, when we're looking with and working with some of the companies like Air Products and, and Suncor and, you know, and ADCO and, you know, you can go on and on and on with the companies that are really investing in the production side. It's it's a real mix of you know primarily natural gas, you know, trying to get to net zero. There's there's also some green, whether it's electrolysis or others. You know, we had a conversation yesterday with David Lazell from the Transition Accelerator, and he talked a lot about it's really about energy. So if you just think about energy and then the splitting of carbon away from it, you know, that's that's kind of you know it's a different way to think about what's the problem. And then it's, you know, how do you make use of the carbon in other ways, whether it's sequestration or, you know, black carbon or carbon nanotubes. So do you have a sense of what's happening around kind of that innovation ecosystem around, you know, pulling value out of the energy and then trying to actually do something with the carbon? I can't say that we have been involved with those conversations to any large extent, but I do know that obviously, they, and that's a good example of where we could come in and help with screening the landscape in Europe, both from a research point of view and but also from a corporate point yeah. of view. Where are you know where do we see all the kernels of the? The answer to that is obviously a very complex and multifaceted answer. Yeah. But you know I think it's about time that we. Um, take internationalization really seriously and, and really consider as a, as a key part of any meaningful industrial strategy. Any thoughts me? Um, I think if you look at business growth or innovation projects, it's never a random process. So if we somehow deconstruct that innovation process, we'll see that it always requires management commitment, and with management commitment and planning comes resource allocation. So we can see what are the priorities, how we are aligning ourselves with national policies or environmental you know, compliance requirements, and that dictates what kind of investment mm -hmm. we want to have in technology, processes, or people. Uh, usually it's maybe a combination of scenarios, but again, in a situation like we are now, and I guess the previous speaker mentioned, the problems that we are tackling are larger and more complex. That brings us to new solutions and also greater collaboration among multi-stakeholders to be able to uh, focus on impact. I guess in Canada, we have a large history of doing a lot of pilots and testing, but it is now the time to focus on scale and impact. Yeah, completely. So, you know, knowing that's the focus, and I, and I agree, that should be the focus now. I'm curious just to flip that around a bit. 
What's the focus of this uh, Norwegian delegation that's here? Uh, you've got a whole bunch of companies, you know, you're here with Innovate Norway. What, what's the goal? The goal to, is to see what's happening in Canada. And this is not the first time that Norwegian delegation has come. Norway has great interest in Canada. And we see great similarities. And we see that we have a policy direction about uh, green energy. We have uh, the know-how and we have the capital to do something about it. Uh, we are visiting uh, industrial heartland in Edmonton mm. tomorrow to see what's going on with all these massive pipeline here to capture carbon and transfer and store that under the ground as a way of preventing it from getting to the atmosphere. Uh, in Norway, again, I mentioned that they do it under the seabed. But also, there are great projects that they are looking at carbon removal and storage as a service. A lot of industries don't have own resources to deal with that, so we see opportunities for a lot of Norwegian players that maybe could come to Canada and look at industrial operations to see how we can manage. You keep, do, you keep doing what you do, but we see if we can help you to properly manage and reduce the carbon emissions. Okay, wonderful. And in Britain, again, we have many companies, many you know, visitors here from across Europe, and many Canadians as well. Do you have a, can you share any of the goals that you know from either your own organization or the companies that you're working with around you know, why they're here, what's brought them? I'd say they, they are beginning to discover uh, Canada as a player in, on, on the hydrogen uh, agenda. Uh, I think Europe was a bit self-absorbed so far and, and probably not entirely unfairly so because a lot yeah. of the, the R&D uh, has been promoted in Europe quite successfully at a large scale. Uh, but all the best R&D in Europe cannot uh, come to market without the product. And of course, you know, Europeans are looking for hydrogen yeah, in Canada. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, they, they just need the product, you know. Okay. And we're just about out of time. So I, um, if you had kind of final thoughts either on, on innovation or on collaboration, um, you know, what, would you, what would you want people to, to be thinking about? For my, I can only repeat and, and, and really emphasize, it is the smart way to look for other people's input, not try to think you can do it all by yourself, reach out to partners, of course reach out to partners in Canada, but reach out to partners as, as systematically and in as, as structured way as possible. Use all the great resources that are out there. We are only just one tiny element of a large landscape of, of internationalization resources. Uh, and uh, I think all our previous uh, clients have found it not only beneficial, but also great fun. And that is also a good part of it. Got to have some fun. Uh, that's a great point, and what I would like to add to that is innovation is about identifying and mitigating risks. And there are a lot of risks that's attached with the market, with the technology and operations. And I can say that there are many companies in Norway that have gone through that process, and we can learn from each other and do business with each other more than before. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, again, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I hope you're really enjoying the show. There's so much going on. From the technical stream to the strategic stream, you know, just the energy and the exhibit. Although I think we're getting close to the end of the day, it's slowing down just a hair in here. I can actually hear myself think at the moment where I couldn't earlier. But again, just want to say thanks so much and uh, really enjoy the conversation. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of the show and enjoy those tours of the Industrial Heartland. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much oh, indeed. You're very yes. welcome. Okay, so we're going to uh, take another quick break. We've got a little video we're going to play, and then we'll be back with a conversation around uh, diesel, hydrogen, and heavy haul. So see you soon. Hello, my name is Kate Chisholm. I have the privilege of serving as Capital Power's Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer. Well, hi, Kate. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, can you just begin by briefly describing Capital Power, uh, what it does in general, but also what it does specifically in the hydrogen space, if you don't mind? Sure. Uh, Capital Power is a publicly traded independent power producer. We're headquartered in Alberta 
but we have over 6,400 megawatts of capacity located in 26 plants all around North America, and we have four more in development. So we're very growth oriented and we are very future oriented. In fact, uh, our purpose is to provide uh, to power the world sustainably for generations to come. And so we work very hard on uh, reducing emissions from thermal generation and expanding uh, North America's renewable portfolio as well. Um, on specifically in hydrogen, uh, Tim, Capital Power actually sees at the pathway to 2050 as being sort of a linear journey from uh Cap carbon capture, utilization, and storage through to hydrogen uh, and uh, net carbon neutral power grid. And so we've been working on uh, emission reduction from thermal generation since 2007. We've, we've had a number of CCUS projects. And you might know that uh, CCUS is one of the two main ways that uh, we produce hydrogen for energy production. Uh, one way is through the electrolysis of water, and we expect that uh, getting closer to 2050 and 2035 to 2050, that that will be the main way of producing hydrogen for power consumption. But uh, between now and then, uh, we believe that more hydrogen will be uh, produced from CCUS, which is, as I said, carbon capture, utilization and storage. How are you seeing the hydrogen space in Edmonton uh, and Alberta specifically, but also Canada at large, evolving? Uh, and how do you see that playing out over the coming years? Above all, it's important uh, to note that there are some incredibly keen, brilliant minds working on hydrogen all over Canada. Um, but in Edmonton and in Alberta specifically, uh, there are some really cool projects. Um, for example, uh, the province announced earlier this summer that they were going to donate money uh, to Air Products one point three billion dollar hydrogen complex, uh, and and so there 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 is already a momentum uh, uh, going on to make Alberta sort of a, a hydrogen hub for Canada. There are lots and lots of people. People at both of our major universities are focused on this uh, directly. Uh, in addition, there are um, uh, really cool investments being made. And so, for example, on Monday, I took part in an announcement uh, uh, in which uh, the province was providing money to CP Rail, which is sort of an un unexpected source for some of this work. Um, and what they've done is, is they are retrofitting two locomotives, they've already done one, to be powered with hydrogen. And these locomotives are going to uh, uh, carry freight trains between Calgary and Edmonton and Lethbridge, uh, completely emission free. And so this is a pilot program, but they're hoping that as they gain experience with this, they will be able to sort of uh, decarbonize their the entire freight rail system in Canada. And so I'm very excited by the fact that a lot of this really cool work is, is happening right here in Calgary, in Edmonton and Alberta. A lot of the technology to produce hydrogen or to produce um, uh, carbon, to capture carbon and, and make fuels like hydrogen is already there, but the demand isn't there. And so what we need to do is create that demand. And so, for example, um, uh, in the CP Rail example, my understanding is that they're using water electrolysis to create hydrogen in Calgary, but they're using CCUS to create their hydrogen in, in Edmonton. Uh, and it is our hope that uh, people will want to have their goods transported by hydrogen-fueled locomotives, hydrogen-fueled trains. You've mentioned CCUS, or Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage, uh, a few times already. And it is, as you said, critical to the whole uh, hydrogen equation and roadmap. Um, how attractive is Canada's CCUS space to foreign investors. It is a space that we have developed some uh, experience and expertise in. Is that being recognized on the global space and attracting FDI to Canada? It's important for the audience to understand that um, CCUS is really important from a, a decarbonization perspective because it's so far the only sort of type of technology that will both avoid emitting new carbon into the atmosphere, but also potentially remove carbon from the atmosphere through direct air capture. Strangely enough, let's say, um, 
Uh, there are a lot of investors, especially outside of Canada and the U.S., that understand maybe better than some Canadians and Americans that uh, we don't hate necessarily fossil fuels. What we hate is the carbon emissions from them, the greenhouse gas emissions from them. And so to the extent that uh, we can burn fossil fuels without emitting greenhouse gases, uh, that's sort of a win-win because there are areas of the world, Canada and the U.S. included, Russia is another one, um, where uh, there is abundant fossil fuel, which could could keep the cost of decarbonization low if only we could make it more environmentally friendly. And so there are ESG investors, for example, in Europe that, that understand this very well, and they are very interested in um, our, our progress here in terms of... Um, propelling decarbonization using CCUS. And, and, and when they do that, they, re, they rely on the fact that there are industry experts like um, the International Environmental Agency and others that are, are, are saying that CCUS, along with an expansion in renewables, energy efficiency, et cetera, are, are sort of the keys to getting to that 2050 net carbon no, neutral point. Now, as far as Canada is concerned, of course, uh, our record for human rights and some of the social um, problems uh, is is very good, but we're also becoming an environmental leader. And so there is, uh, as far as Canada is concerned, a uh, growing uh, group, not only of ESG investors directly investing in responsible companies, but they're also placing pressure on the banks, for example, to... Uh, consider ESG considerations into their financing. They're, they're placing pressure on insurance companies to consider ESG in, in their assessment of business risks. And they're also placing uh, a lot of pressure on credit rating agencies to consider uh, ESG considerations in, in their business risks and their assignment of uh, credit ratings. And so all of this is coming together to a point where ESG considerations are uh, at least as important to many investors, financiers, uh, risk managers as, as the financial ones. Um, and and uh, we like that trend. We think that's the right thing for Canada and the world. When you look at Edmonton and Canada, uh, in terms of our competitive advantages for attracting FDI uh, to the hydrogen space, to the carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage space, what stands out in terms of our USPs or where we uh, compete best? Let's be frank. Alberta has a burning platform. We need to figure this out. And uh, because of that, we have uh, attracted some of the best minds in the world in order to help us address the, the energy transition problem and to help us over time convert what has been um, a uh, a heavy emitter of greenhouse gas uh, into uh, um, what we hope will be uh, low or no carbon uh, industry. And so uh, we have a lot of expertise here. We also have the desire to be the world leader in terms of uh, hydrogen, for example, and CCUS, we have in Alberta uh, geology that will allow us to capture and sequester both uh, carbon and hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen storage is uh, a bit of a long putt at the moment because hydrogen has a very low volumetric density um, and, um, and so it's hard to capture and it's very expensive to store. Um, and it's also harder to move through pipelines at the moment, uh, at least through our existing pipeline system, because it's caustic and it, it burns at very low temperatures and it, it, there are safety concerns. But we have the people that are working on all of these problems and figuring out how to move hydrogen through pipelines, how to um, store and then use uh, store captured carbon and then use it to create hydrogen and so on. And so I, I think probably along with our desire to solve this problem, the biggest advantage we have is so many really, really great brains focused on it at the moment. Kate, uh, we're going to wrap up, but I want to know what you think has to be done and by who uh, to accelerate Canada's hydrogen opportunity, uh, but also to attract more foreign investors uh, into our hydrogen sector. Well, thanks, Tim. Uh, at a high level, Three things need to be need to happen. 
first of all, we, we need policy to settle down. Um, you heard me talk about the size of some of the investments that are needed. Uh, you know, when, when you're making a $2 billion or a $5 billion or a $3 billion investment that you hope to live over decades, uh, your shareholders would assassinate you if, if you did that irresponsibly. And so what, what you need to do is, is to have some confidence in your project economics. Uh, and what that requires is policy stability. So we need to sort of all be rowing our canoe in the same direction so that we can, we can take these big bets. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is we're going to need subsidies in, in the beginning because as you and I discussed, the demand isn't necessarily there yet. So we're going to provide a supp the supply of, of these um, uh, carbon reducing technologies with the hopes that people will actually use them and buy them. Uh, but it, until that happens, we're going to need some help from government. Uh, and so we're seeing both uh, in Alberta and federally, investments in CCUS, which will form the hydrogen infrastructure needed to take us out to 2050. And, and the, fine, the final thing is we need a sort of a high level of sort of coordination. And this is maybe the hardest thing because eventually what we're going to want to do is convert pipeline systems over to hydrogen and so on. And that requires uh, the collaboration of industry players, regulators, um, uh, uh, communities so that we can convert things that are now using natural gas to hydrogen and so on. And that level of coordination is we're going to require a lot of planning. And so I know there are a lot of people out there that would like us to be able to sort of do the genie, you know, and make it all happen, but it's actually going to take uh, some planning and uh, some very careful thought. And we're back. I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global. We're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub exhibit. Uh, I'm joined now by Rebecca Goldsack, who's the COO with DTI. And you're a really cool company blending AI, hydrogen, and diesel in the heavy haul trucking industry. Can you just tell us just a little bit about what you guys do? Yeah, so we have a technology called the Guardian Hydrogen Diesel Dual Fuel Technology. And if that's a mouthful, we call it H2DF for short. And really what it is, is taking an existing engine that's available on the market, such as a Cummins ISX or Detroit DD series engine, and retrofitting it so that it can accept hydrogen as a secondary fuel source. So we're starting off at that 20% ratio, getting all the way up to 80% hydrogen. Wow. Yeah, so really what our technology is based on is really driving innovative technology for the transportation industry. And all of our technologies that we've ever developed are really rooted in reading and interpreting data and providing an action. Okay, so I, I'm still just floored by that. <laughs> up to 80% up to hydrogen you could do? I, I yeah. thought it was, you know, maybe 20%. So to our knowledge, we are one of the only ones that are actually doing more than 20%. So you can put 20% hydrogen in relatively easy. Uh, it's just using yep. a single port injection system. It's, it just you know, uses hydrogen, um, but you cannot go past that 20% 20 20 threshold without changing different engine parameters. So turning down what would be an existing diesel injection system. And we're working on a multi-port injection system so that you're actually putting in hydrogen into each individual cylinder so that you're going to get equal ratios of hydrogen and really putting it in intelligently so that you're not wasting any hydrogen and you're putting it in at those optimal spots where you're going to burn it as efficient as you possibly can. Okay, so this this can't just be a mechanical solution then? Like it's way more complicated. There's so much involved in it. So it's got both the mechanical side of it, so the technology to actually retrofit the engine, and we're making sure that it's as simple as and as easy as possible for any end user or installer or any fleet to be able to use this technology. And then it's got the other side of it, which has the AI, the machine learning, the algorithms, all the technology that 
is based behind that because it's really a lot different if you're driving down the highway versus you know stopping at a bunch of set of lights right. and so your hydrogen ratios and when you're putting that hydrogen in is really based on that so our company uses over 50 different engine parameters that we're reading and it's actually taking all that engine data to provide when to do it so we're reading things like boosts temperatures pressures all that different data and it's actually going to then send that information as to when to put that hydrogen in so there's lots mm. of AI that is just does it all. Yes. Most AI has some human component to it. Is this, it, you've got to be doing this real time. So does the operator have to do anything as you're driving the truck or is it all inside the system? It, it's all inside the system. And as we develop and learn new things about the technology or you know, want to increase those ratios, there's actually a tablet that sits inside the truck. Mm. And that's actually going to be the interface system that sends that information back and forth so that we can get that optimal efficiency. And that way we're able to, on the fly, so say you know we want to get an extra 10% hydrogen ratio out of that truck, we can actually push that um, update to the technology, through the technology to the truck to increase that efficiency. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. I'm still, I'm trying to think about the next question, but I'm still just picturing that. That's, that's really cool. So again, knowing it's a range with 80% yes. being the most. Do you have kind of a standard for how much uh, fuel you're saving or how much carbon you're, you're preventing from going to the atmosphere? So one nice thing about hydrogen is that it's actually essentially steam cleaning the engine. So you're reducing you know, your NOx and SOx and particulate matter by over 50% just doing it at the base level, but you're ultimately able to you know, reduce your, all of those emission systems the more hydrogen that you're putting in because you're making that engine so much cleaner and by doing that you're also making what they put in trucks right now is an EGR and DPF system you're making them I'll so pretend that they, I know what that means so what that is is it's it's the system that makes the trucks more clean okay. and it it's burning all that carbon buildup so that it's working it's not in the atmosphere Got so it. those are all the emission systems that they've done just in the trucking industry to get to a cleaner technology for the trucks, but this just essentially eliminates it. It's still installed, it's still there, but it d requires it not to have to work as hard okay. because it's all clean before it actually gets to that wow. system. So do you have a sense then of what the emissions reduction mm -hmm. is, kind of tailpipe side? Yeah, so it, it's all, at a minimum it's that 50%, but we can get it all the way up to 90%. Really? Yeah, it's because you're essentially at 80%, you're really going to just be mainly running on hydrogen and not on on diesel. So, And because it's only that low ratio of diesel, it's so clean that you're not going to have any of that particulate and NOx and SOx and wow, all the, that's that carbon emission systems. You know, we, we talk so much about one of the hardest industries to decarbonize is heavy haul trucking. Like, I know you've used <laughs> yeah. a lot of things that I didn't totally understand and some of those acronyms, but you didn't make it sound that hard. And if you can get to you know ninety percent, that's that's just a massive achievement. And, and exactly, and for the transportation industry, I mean, diesels have been around since the beginning of yeah, trucking for a long inceptions, time. and you know it's a safe bet for a lot of the transportation industry. So, by having a cost-effective solution for these customers, that is not going to leave them stranded. You know, if they don't have that hydrogen supply available, you know, if they're in the middle of nowhere, they still can run on that diesel. So it's it's really allowing for that, you know, transition to the next phase of really that clean hydrogen and ultimately decarbonizing the transportation industry. I'm really glad you raised that. You know, we've we talked so much about this chicken and the egg. You know, you need enough production to drive demand, but you need enough demand to drive production. And especially in things like heavy haul, until there's a fuel, you know, infrastructure to, to fuel up, yeah. it's going to be really risky to be the first mover. But if you can run your system or run just mm -hmm. diesel, depending on availability, you're really de-risking it. Exactly. And, you know, making sure that we're making it cost effective. You know, when these trucks cost $200,000, you know, to put a $80,000 system in there is not a cost effective solution. Yeah. But if we can get into between that twenty dollars and $30,000 retrofit kit system and, you know, you're reducing all of your maintenance costs because your emission systems are not going to be all full of gunk and then you have you know you're 
burning on clean hydrogen, which is ultimately going to reduce all your NOx and SOx and everything like that. And then it's just taking that to the next level. So it's really an, a nice, safe bet for you know the transportation industry. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Um, okay, again, there's so many things you've said that I'm not even sure where to take the next question. Um, what's, like, how, how come you guys aren't worth, like, why aren't you a, a unicorn right now? <laughs> this, this is something that uh, is a huge demand the world over. You know, the, the amount that's spent, uh, you know, buying new fleets, because I think, what is it, every five years, a lot of the trucks get turned over. Um, are, is your door just be absolutely being beat down? Yeah, it's, it's crazy to see the amount of interest that people have in it. Uh, but then it comes down to that chicken and egg scenario. Yeah. And that's, you know, what we're trying to, you know, educate people on and make sure that they're aware that, you know, and as government agencies and stuff start pushing for, you know, this clean tech and, you know, decarbonizing everything, it's really giving that added incentives. And yeah. if you fueled up in the last uh, few months, you've seen what uh, gas and diesel prices have done. And Absolutely. I think that's just giving companies just that extra drive that they need to, you know, really see what they can do to A, reduce costs and B, make sure that they're, you know, helping, uh, helping the go to a green, yeah. a green world. Absolutely. Okay. So is this, do you install this in an existing fleet? Is it a new fleet installation? You know, what, how do you actually do this? So it's actually done on any existing fleet. Okay. Um, what we're mainly focusing on is units that are no more than five years old, just okay. because the average life expectancy of a truck is on average about 10, 10 to 15 years. So there's no not a large point, not to say I won't yeah. do it, but- You need the, ROI though. Yes, and to get that ROI, you're really looking at that, you know, less than five year um, truck. And you can put it across whether you have a small fleet of just, you know, one or two trucks, all the way up to, you know, a huge fleet. And it's it's really making sure that it's, you know, that yeah. that initiative that they, they can do. Okay, so I mean, I'm sure that you've got a bit of a price window, depending on how many units, what people are doing. Can you give me a sense of, you know, what does it cost to outfit a truck? So it, it totally depends on the truck and how much hydrogen you're using. So one of the big things for this is the hydrogen storage. So the amount of cylinders that are required to go onto the tank. So at, you know, one hydrogen cylinder, a couple hydrogen cylinders, you know, we're able to keep that cost relatively low. And then as we go up into the 80% hydrogen, there's obviously more cost. So it's right. it's between about fifteen to thirty thousand dollars and that's kind of where we're wow, looking to reasonable. you know make sure that and as we can scale it, you know, as we can increase how many people are doing it, obviously that's gonna bring our, our cost down and you know make it a relatively inexpensive uh, retrofit for these customers. So so I asked a lot of questions at the beginning about you know reducing emissions, reducing carbon. Um, didn't really talk about reducing cost, but you know, where do you see that at? I mean, there's not a huge supply of hydrogen right now, but you know, as you look out into the future, do you have a sense of what the fuel savings are going to be through using this technology? Yeah. So it right now it's it's kind of if I had a crystal ball to yeah. you know talk about it, um, but as the hydrogen we're not going to hold you to whatever the numbers are. So. So what we're anticipating is, even on a green hydrogen, that it'll be relatively the same cost as what a diesel um, comparative would be. So oh, okay. um, that's kind of where we're looking um, to sit within. You know, right now it's it can be quite expensive for that green hydrogen, but even a blue and gray, um, you know, it's that price competitive is right now. But it's once again the supply and demand and the yeah. chicken and egg. So as supply starts increasing, um, you know that demand is there, and it'll ultimately bring down the cost and you know make it so that it's a lot more competitive for these customers. But making sure that even you know from the beginning that it's really there. Yeah, well, it, and it's coming fast. Um, you know, Suncor just made a big announcement earlier today with the MTA around producing liquid hydrogen for for the trucking industry as well as, as bus fleets, because we have a whole bunch of trucks and buses coming on, on hydrogen. Uh, Air Products, they're starting construction hopefully this spring. I know they're trying to be finished com their construction by 2024, and that'll be the world's largest net zero hydrogen facility that, that's being built right here. And a big part of that is, is liquid hydrogen. Um, and there's all kinds mm -hmm. of talk about more and more fueling stations. So I think, I think we're right on, on the cusp of it. And it's going to start here in Canada, but 
you know, probably quickly after we'll have, we'll have Calgary, we'll have Vancouver, we'll have other places, you know, moving us further towards Toronto. Have you looked at kind of the modeling of, of how that rollout looks for you? Yeah, and a lot of, actually a lot of where this kind of plays out is actually on the carbon tax credits. Mm. So, you know, some provinces are offering a lot more incentive. And so it's a lot easier to, you know, get to those areas. But then at the same time, too, some provinces offer a more green um, elect- electricity yeah. system. So it actually makes it more cost effective to go there. So there's definitely different uh, pros and cons to each different province and which ones are you know with all these announcements that even Alberta's made in the last even 24 hours has been you know huge for our industry and it's it's only the beginning and that's why we're so excited to be part of the the change and the evolution of clean tech yeah it's fantastic and you know we've we've had a lot of conversation over the last two days that um, this is a global challenge we need global solutions so we're going to do a lot of things, you know, here in the Edmonton region in Alberta that work for what's happening here. But we need it. We need different things to work in different places, and all of us to get onto this. Yeah. So it's. I. I think the, what you just described makes a makes a and ton I mean, of sense. Being in Alberta, it is one of the biggest things. Is we have very, you know, we have to be very robust. I mean, we've got, yeah. you know, roads that are, you know in the middle of nowhere and then we've also got this wonderful cold climate so you know making sure I mean hydrogen is essentially water it freezes so making sure that you know it's working at these you know minus 50 temperatures so that when you go to somewhere like Ontario where they have a very mild winter we know it's going to work every time because of you know so designing it for the worst scenario and then taking it into an easier yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're almost out of time, so we're going to ask a couple of questions and yes. we'll do maybe kind of quick back and forth. Um, you've been in Nashville, you've been in Toronto, you've been meeting with investors all over the place. Again, I don't know why you're not a unicorn already. Uh, can you give us a bit of a sense on uh, how much investment you're looking for? Are you looking for investment still? You know, again, we've got people tuning in from all over the place that are looking for really cool companies to, uh, to be partnered with. Where are you at? Yeah, so we are definitely uh, looking for investment. Um, we're depending on, you know, we have to find the right fit for us because we kind of have our roadmap already yeah. set out. Um, so definitely looking for a strategic partner that's willing to, you know, work with us um, to expedite this process. Um, so we're looking anywhere between, you know, a million to three million dollars in our first uh, first round uh, to really just push this and get it onto the market as fast as we possibly can. Okay. That should be more than doable. Um, maybe stick around. There's about five companies I can introduce you to later Perfect. on this afternoon that might gobble that right up. Um, okay, so thanks so much for this conversation. Again, big fans of the work you're doing. That, that marriage between AI, hydrogen, you know, transportation sector, it's amazing that we've got companies here really building that out. So, so thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so next we're, uh, we're going to take another little break. Uh, I think we've got one or two more conversations yet to come this afternoon. And again, I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global, and we're joining you from the Canadian Hydrogen Convention right here inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub booth, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much. Nawako Magantik, Tamskat Dinawao Gakiao, Natoki Tope Natsigas, and Muskeg Seoche. My name is Sacred Rider, Chief Billy Morin from the Enoch Cree Nation, and I am the Vice Chair of the Hydrogen Hub in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Well, hi, Chief Morin. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, speak with us today and to speak to the TFE community. Um, I want to start with uh, speaking about or exploring how you would characterize the potential uh, that hydrogen represents for Canada's future economy. Yeah, great question, Tim. Uh, thanks for the question and thanks for the, uh, the opportunity today. Well, the, the potential is quite simply this. Um, 2050 uh, net zero for Canada is, is a real thing. And I think we have to get there tangibly and practically. And uh, hydrogen um, will be a pillar of a net zero uh, carbon economy in Canada. Uh, I think it's, it, it goes without saying that this is, uh, Alberta in particular, um, probably the strongest opportunity economically to uh, start to transition um, to a more 
uh, net zero economy. Uh, again, noting that we can transition with the expertise, the experience, um, the know-how, and quite frankly, the identity of Edmonton and Alberta in oil and gas into something such as hydrogen. So you are the vice chair of the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, which was recently created. Um, I want to ask two questions about that. First of all, what is a hydrogen hub? How would you define that? And who are the parties involved in Edmonton's uh, regional hydrogen hub? So the hub is, is quite simply in Edmonton at this point, uh, a combination of local municipal leaders, uh, government leaders, um, local uh, private industry, um, local arms like organizations such as the, uh, the Accelerator, um, local business groups such as the Sturgeon County um, Heartland Association, so private sector, government, and uh, it takes regionally all these players um, to really, again, create that, that zone, create that, uh, that environment to excel hydrogen into actual development instead of just talking about it. And the final ingredient there, I would say, is the First Nations themselves. So, you know, here in Edmonton, Alberta and Canada, um, we're seeing reconciliation economically and reconciliation action, of, including First Nations. So uh, we're proud to be at the table in, in the hydrogen hub, and I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to, to be the vice chair. Why was Edmonton and the region uh, chosen for Canada's first hydrogen hub? And what do you see as the region's unique advantages for this, especially in terms of investors who are looking to, uh, to, to benefit from the potential that hydrogen represents for the future economy? I guess Edmonton's advantage is this. Again, this is oil and gas country. We have an abundant amount of uh, amount of gas and gas infrastructure here, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna have blue hydrogen. We have all the variables: the the capital, um, the infrastructure. Again, the gas supply. Um, we have the expertise in refining and extraction of gas, and uh, that's what's really driving this process. It's, it's economically viable here with the same principles and the foundation that we have. So that's what makes Edmonton different and, and going to be the catalyst in Canada. For, for investors foreign, for, uh, for foreign investors on how they're going to come into the region and what makes them feel safe is, again, um, the hub itself is, is not just you know, the city by itself. It's not just one minister by themselves. It's not just one kind of pie in the sky company. It's local regional players at all levels who want to facilitate this growth. And I'm not sure you have that coordination in other regions uh, across Canada. This is the most coordinated one. Uh, this is the one that makes the most economic sense. And so this is the one that's already translated into something like Air Products investing in $1 billion into the local region. So, again, uh, all the, uh, the factors and the leaders are moving in the same direction for foreign investment. You mentioned that First Nations have to have a seat at the table and they do in you being the vice chair. Um, how do you think First Nations and Indigenous stakeholders have to be engaged in development of hydrogen, uh, not only in Edmonton, but across Canada? And how well is Edmonton doing this? Can you mention any instances of uh, lessons learned, lesson learned or best practices? Yeah, for First Nations engagement, you know, I look to um, we look to history. And here in Canada, again, um, you know, resource extraction um, for First Nations has always been paternalistic. The Indian Act, which legislates uh, First Nations business and First Nations interaction, even just within the economy, has held First Nations back for uh, the better part of a century now, uh, especially when it comes to oil and gas. So, you know, there's so many lessons to be learned because that legacy, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing great wins. Um, but we're also seeing wins too much defined in court and, and too much defined in, in adversarial, too much defined in conflict. Um, but there's, there's lessons to be learned again, because again, and early on in the oil and gas development process, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago, when my great grandfather was chief, uh, it was, it was the minister of indigenous relations controlling that right from the transaction, right to the, uh, sharing of wealth and building the nation from those, those resources. And now, Early on in the development of a new kind of industry, building off of uh, industries that have already been here, First Nations are right there, right at the start, right at the start, maybe in the regulatory conversation, right at the start in the production conversation, right at the start in the equity equity conversation. So again, um, you know, to us, uh, hydrogen represents that transition um, and that opportunity for lessons learned that were uh, First Nations were wronged in, in the past when it comes to oil and gas development. So uh, kind of a clean slate and First Nations are ready to participate at this time. It's not just about the bottom line. 
it's you got to come into the nations and get to know the people. You got to come in uh, and get to know, as juvenile as this sounds, uh, Billy's grandma. You got to participate in the ceremony. You got to share a meal with us. And again, that might sound a little juvenile, but uh, what you can think of First Nations as is, is large family businesses. So a community such as mine is a 2,600 and 32 person family business. And the way family businesses um, do business is you got to come and meet us. Uh, we're very welcoming, by the way. So we love to share um, uh, our story. We love to share our culture and uh, we're very welcoming. Oh, I love the idea of that. And uh, I hope you can hook up our next interview with Billy's grandma because uh, we'd love to expose <laughs> her to the world as well. <laughs> it's kind of true because uh, again, large family business is Billy's grandma was on leadership before. Billy's grandma um, uh, oversees business as a leader 20 years ago. So again, she's the elder in the room who I have to run things by. So she's not just my grandma. She's also a senior advisor to the nation. I want to know um, in terms of economic growth, in terms of uh, all the other opportunities that it might represent, uh, how do you define or characterize the potential for hydrogen uh, for Indigenous populations, uh, Indigenous First Nations, not only necessarily uh, for Enoch in Edmonton or in Alberta, but across the board, across Canada? Well, for us, um, what potential does hydrogen production rep represent for Indigenous nations? It represents to us across Canada, not just Enoch, the opportunity to live up to our reputation. So, you know, Indigenous people are seen as the stewards of the land. We're here to ultimately protect the land. That's the teachings historically our elders um, passed down to us as our responsibility to do right by Mother Earth, to also find a balance in making uh, money, creating business, but doing it in a sustainable way that honors Mother Earth and our traditional teachings. That's what hydrogen to me represents in this local regional economy in the hub. You mentioned throughout the interview all these different groups that are involved in the hub that have to be involved in the hub to ensure its success. Uh, government, uh, business, both local and foreign, and obviously First Nations, such as yourself. Um, how cooperative are all these partners in the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub? Um, and from a foreign investor's perspective, how welcoming do you see that business ecosystem as being? Well, right now, I would say local partners are, 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 are very much on the same page. So, you know, again, we're fortunate enough as First Nations to sit at that table with uh, multiple other uh, mayors and, and local regional representatives. And, uh, you know, when boots hit the ground on, on something like um, air products investment into uh, a production facility on the east side of Edmonton, um, they can count on the local mayor. They can count on the local First Nations. They can count on the local industry um, throughout the production uh, value chain and the systematic chain to, to be there for support. I think, again, if you're a foreign investor, um, you know, come and see us, come and talk to us. And, you know, I think the First Nations themselves, as opposed to maybe the municipalities or even the private sector, have a different arm's length um, access to the government, a different lobbying, a different uh, mechanism to go into government and say, like, because, um, again, we categorize ourselves as nations. So ultimately, we're here to share um, but First Nations themselves can create legislation. They can create regulatory regimes. Uh, we would never do it at the cost of quality, but I think we represent an arm that has never been thought of by private sector, industry, and quite frankly, foreign investment to create over, get over these little humps and these little regulations and these little things that governments sometimes do to get in the way of, of new innovations and new sectors. So um, as a foreign investor, some of the first people I want to talk to actually, if I was them, would be the First Nations to create that environment for kind of fast, the speed of business, innovation, getting it from just an idea over uh, getting it just from research to commercialization. I think First Nations represent kind of a new arm to get it there sooner.
Hi, I'm Chris. Ooh, that's loud. Hi, I'm Chris McLeod with Edmonton Global. Uh, we're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub. And I am thrilled to be joined by Mayor Elena Natchew. Uh, she is the mayor of Sturgeon County, and really for today, she's also the chair of the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub and has been just an absolute leader in making not just this hydrogen convention happen, but just all the things that have been happening across our region in hydrogen. So, Mayor Natchew, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Chris. Yeah, and absolutely. thank you to Edmonton Global for creating this uh, magical spot here. There's been a lot of great networking and conversations. It's very welcoming and has set the tone for what the entire convention is, which is welcome to the region, welcome to hydrogen. Yeah, but thanks so much. You know, it, there's a whole bunch of people that got together to do this. And one of the things that, that I'm really happy about is this is a collaboration. So there's so many organizations from the federal government to the province, you know, all these municipalities, First Nations, um, people like Emissions Reduction Alberta. It's, it's really rare, I think, that that many organizations get together to do something for the greater good. And I think that's what makes hydrogen a bit of the unicorn. It's just this level of alignment between communities, economic development organizations, all levels of government, industry, thought leaders, yeah. uh, entrepreneurs. I mean, and that's, that's the beauty of the mix that's here. Because planning the future of the energy evolution, supporting what organically takes place, but also facilitating a transition of a complex system of not just fuel, yeah. but of electricity, of, of local demand and accessing export markets. That takes a lot of diversity of thought and diversity of approach and open and honest conversations. And I think there's just been a level of collaboration from the very inception that has started to create the relationships yeah. which you know just set the expectation and the standards for the kind of communication and collaboration that is necessary and, and in my opening remarks the other day I mentioned and and this has been a part of the conversation for you know over two years about the type of courageous and radically collaborative yeah. leadership um, that that we need and I'm really pleased to see that showing up across sectors uh, and that's why we're here today that's why we could pull this together in a matter of mere months. Yeah, and, and see, so just hold the mic just a hair closer, perfect. And you know, I love that you're using that word radical. You know, and one of the things we've really been trying to do as Epitech Global is drive radical transformation of our economy. And the work that you're leading around hydrogen, you know, is an absolute living proof that it's possible. You know, a year ago, we weren't really talking that much about hydrogen. Today we've got you know somewhere between two and four thousand people here from around the world who've bought into it, you know, understand what's possible, and are trying to find ways to collaborate, to invest, and to learn from what's already happening. So how, how does it feel to be, you know, someone who's who's again chairing the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub and seeing this stuff kind of come together? Well, as somebody who's responsible for public dollars and yeah. for the future of a community, I'm always seeking to validate and prove value. And so, again, in my remarks, talking about the intersection of value and values, mm. which the energy of evolution really has to consider. What's our value set? But where's the value and the yeah. employment and the economics and, and the environment? All of those things come together. So I'm really pleased to see how many people showed up and to see the, the, all, the, all of the work come to fruition in such a really energetic way. And so for the conversations that I've had, people have seen value in this. So those of us who've been rolling the rock uphill for yeah. two years are seeing value in the work. Those that have been you know, thinking about this in their, their labs and their basements uh, or their boardrooms are seeing value in the connections of all of the different varieties of people that are here from around the world. So to me, that's 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 the cherry on top and something obviously that will support the, the next nine years when this comes back year after year after year. So I'm pleased to see that we've held true to our values to know that we need to do ESG, not just in documents, but in action. Yeah. Uh, and I'm getting that sense from the conversations I've had for the people that you know have come here. So, so for me, that's a hugely gratifying, but it, it, this is also just the start. Yeah. Well, it, it, the goal of this conference is to grow it into the world's largest hydrogen conference. Um, 
we want within five years for this to be a 40 to 50,000 person event. And I need to change my language because I keep saying we want and instead I need to say it is going to be. Because I think the whole region is so focused on this. And we had a conversation with Invest in Canada earlier. We've talked a lot to uh, Invest Alberta and others. And it really feels like there's, there's, again, more than our community, there's a whole nation behind trying to make this happen. And this can be kind of the, the focal point for what's, what's going on really in North America. Um, I'm curious about some of the conversations you've had. So, you know, you've been here, you've had, you know, you've been on the main Seven stage. Seven o'clock Tuesday morning. <laughs> yeah, you know, early every day, late every night. Um, do you have some big takeaways from some of the conversations you've had with people, whether that's, you know, locals or internationals that are here? Well, I think the takeaway is what's worked here, collaboration, yeah. which is really the inception of the, uh, the hub when the transition accelerator was, was doing their work on, you know, hydrogen being a disruptor that could be a game changer. They were looking for people that were willing to listen to that story. And the Heartland Association having over 20 years of collaboration, proving success and having, you know, being a game changer in the region, but across Alberta and across Canada, that kind of collaboration is what gave the board the trust yeah. to take the next steps. And we add in more partners and take more steps and add in more partners. So the collaboration that was the inception of this will also need to be consistent throughout. Yeah. And that's the takeaway, the level of discussion and collaboration that brought this together. Again, we need to continue to collaborate going forward so that we can all head back to our boardrooms, our communities, our countries, and, and level up sharing enough information because ultimately the winner is, is the world. The yeah. whole point of this is to decarbonize, to lower our emissions, and to drive jobs and a bright future for for the earth and for yeah. all of our, our children on it. And so I think this will play an important role in paving the pathway to that future. Yeah, you know, so much of the theme of this, uh, of what the conversations we've had, and especially the interviews we've been doing on our, uh, on our stage here, have been about, you know, this is a, is a global challenge. Uh, it's, it's also a global opportunity. And the whole world needs to transition. It's not just that it's, it's about one region or one place winning over another. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how do we solve this global challenge. And it, it's really, um, uh, I don't even know what the right word is for it. Uh, it's kind of humbling to think that we're at the middle of this and that we're kind of demonstrating what's possible to the rest of the world and, and maybe helping solve some of those problems, whether that's by exporting technologies or process or collaborative models uh, or export of hydrogen. So I, I, I just kind of wonder about, you know, have you, it's too early yet to talk about legacies coming out of some of this work, but as being the, the person who really helped not just the industrial heartland, you know, over the years get into this, but really helped form the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, you know, do you, have you started to think about that, like legacy, now that you're, you know, here? You know, I've already, you know, don't want to say I've left the building, but I'm already like a week from now yeah. saying, okay, you've got a stack of business cards, you've made some relationships. Yeah. Uh, now we need to action that. And, and, and that's the exciting part about the, the conversations I've had here. There's, there's sh movers and shakers here. Oh, yeah. There's, there's people who, much like myself, um, understand the importance of pilot projects and demonstration projects, but this is a time of implementation. There is technology that exists already to be able to start yeah. the transition. Um, and perfection is the enemy of good. Uh, so... I'm pleased to see Nicola. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see uh, just all of the opportunities here to actually start to implement lower carbon footprints in our life day to day. And it's also been interesting because I think regionally we push each other. Yeah. As you know, uh, we are always expecting more, better, uh, driving things forward. So I think we've become quite critical of ourselves. And so it's been interesting to see the perspective of the outside world showing up and telling us what they think of us and the opportunities that they see. And so it's been a bit of a reset of perspective as well to be mm -hmm. really grateful for what we have, but it also has just reinvigorated the sense of responsibility to be a good steward of the natural resources that we have because ultimately our best natural resources yeah. are people totally. and that's what's going to drive it and that's really the impetus for all of this work. So, so that's been a, a positive thing. 
Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, I, I, I don't care if you did or not. It was a really good answer. <laughs> um, you know, and you're you're a global thinker. You know, you're you've, you've traveled. You've you had conversations with the companies. You know, from all different walks. You know, again, led the uh, the, the uh, Heartland Association. You know, I, I know recently you were in the UAE meeting with with companies and governments. You know, there's a lot of similarity between what's happening there and what's happening here. Uh, they've got a lot of big, you know, big militaries, big economies surrounding them. You know, we've got the U.S. You know, kind of surrounding us. Um, again, around that spirit of and thinking around collaboration and global mindset, I wonder too. And again, we've got a large delegation of them here. Uh, are there similarities in in the challenge that you see between? You know, countries like the UAE and Canada, or other countries around the world, that we, we actually just had a conversation with uh, Innovate Norway, and just seems so similar the things that they're trying to do and the challenges they're facing. And I just wonder if you've got perspective on that. Well, my my takeaway from from my trip what, there is that we have more in common yeah. uh, than we than we do different, which is always the important part of traveling is because we can become quite isolated and start to feel like we're different or, or better than or mm -hmm. that we don't have things in common, especially if people don't look like us. And so, or, or we think they don't, you know, yep. necessarily their societies aren't structured the same, but we all want the same thing in the end. And we all see the value in, you know, agriculture. Like that's what I, I took away. There's so many synergies around aviation, aerospace, yep. agriculture, energy and that transition from natural gas to renewables but also the understanding and the responsibility of dealing with peak weather and making yeah. sure that people stay warm when they yeah. need to stay warm and cool when they need to stay uh, cool. I mean obviously I was um, certainly envious of the fact they don't have frost cycles to deal with. It's, they can you know, build things in different uh, timelines and investment cycles than we do here. But, but just the alignment and the interest mm -hmm. around agriculture and energy was really interesting. And just their desire to want to build a, a better, healthier, happier society. And in the end, that is the motivation yeah, for absolutely. anyone in public service anyway that, that, I, that I work with. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub. And, and maybe just about the region's value prop as well. Um, when you are talking to companies, when you're talking to investors, or even you know other government leaders, kind of what's what's the pitch you give about what's happening here and why people should be paying attention? Well, again, just back to the people. Yeah. You know, I think everybody here is really motivated to to look at the investment that's here already, and figure out how we can you know, build a pathway to a brighter future using what's already invested because taxpayers don't necessarily care to see the house of cards knocked down or yep. shifts happen and, and, and sunk costs lost. So anytime that we can leverage investment and whether that's the skill set of the labor force mm -hmm. that's here or the infrastructure in the ground, that's the important piece. But again, I think maybe it's the northern climate we live in. We are highly collaborative. And again, I think that's why we can move as quickly as we do and as, and as far as we do, as fast as we do. Yeah. So obviously that's the, the leverage, uh, in whether it's working at the Edmonton Metro Regional Board or at Edmonton Global or at the Heartland Association or at the Hub. I see the importance of relationships and trying to figure out what everybody needs out of it uh, and then trying to you know, build a, a framework that supports the needs and the deliverables of everybody at the table. And we do that here and it's not easy. No. It's it's like you know it's like any family. Sometimes the the dinners are messy, but yeah. in the end we all have the same uh, outcomes desired, and that's to have a relevant, healthy economy, and a sound environment, and be good stewards of the natural resources that are here, and to be able to grow. Uh, you know, if this population is going to you know go to double in the next yeah. 25 years, that takes some really thoughtful and intentional planning. And the people at the table right now are the right people at the table. We've got some really uh, impressive thought leaders in the communities and First Nations as well. And so now is really carpe diem, you know, seize the day. And that's, that's the value proposition is not just what we have underground in geology and geography, but the people that are sitting at the table right now. Yeah, and the, the commitment to get it done. Uh, so, you know, on that note about having the right leaders and the right people at the table, I think that's maybe a good place to end because I, you know, I've, I've worked here for you know, 
three and a half years, really since the beginning of Epton Global. I've lived in the region you know, most of my life. I'd say we have the right leaders in place. We've got the right people leading the work of the hub. We've got just amazing energy uh, you know, with, with you really at the helm of it. Uh, but it's, it is the universities, the colleges, the polytechnics, the, you know, the political leaders, the business leaders, um, you know, the financial leaders, you name it, people are getting behind this, are believing in what we're trying to do. And that, that mix, I think, is where the magic happens. So, you know, if, if, if people aren't paying attention to what's going on in the Edmonton region, you know, before, they need to, to be peril. now. Yes. To their peril. Because this is where it's going to happen. Yeah. So again, I want to just say thank you so much for, for being here, for having this quick little conversation, uh, for all the work you've done to help make this possible, and for the amazing things that are going to come. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Chris. It's been an incredible uh, couple of days, and I'm looking forward to next year already. Yeah, me too. So we're going to at least double the size next year, probably, probably quadruple it. Again, we wanted this to be the largest hydrogen convention in the world. We think we're going to hit about 50,000 people within five years. This is the last live stream conversation we're having you know, for these two days. That's not actually the end of the conference, though. We've got tours happening across Alberta's industrial heartland tomorrow. Uh, that is more than fully subscribed. So we've got a packed house with that. We've got an investor summit running tomorrow. We've got tours happening around other parts of the region over the next couple of days. Uh, and next year is going to be even better. So if you haven't booked your tickets yet, book them. We'll see you here next year. And on behalf of Edmonton Global, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, and all of our partners, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you next year. Ba-ba-da-ba-da-ba-ba-ba-da-boom ba ba da ba da ba 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 